TV AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. All right, it's half past seven. It is Wednesday, Thursday. 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 Hooray, the week is nearly over. Thursday morning, you're very welcome along to OTB AM. Time is a flat circle, folks. Uh, Shane, how are you? Good morning, Joe. How are things? Morning, very good. Everyone. Very good, yeah, yeah. And that's into the world that you uh, like to smoke the herb. It's very good. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I bought this. Uh, <laughs> I bought this in uh, Cool Runnings. I've got twice so far, but I actually bought this in Addis Ababa Airport in Ethiopia. Oh, right, little flex. Yeah, it humble was, brag. One of those things. You know, when I was climbing Kilimanjaro. You know that, that thing I did. I found the the airport not very welcoming. And Addis uh, Ababa. Like, yeah, I bought coffee beans, and that was it. One of the most bizarre airport experiences. Actually, the most bizarre airport experience I've ever had. Um, Pandemonium, mayhem. Why do you fly? Didn't, didn't <coughs> seem built. What country is Kilimanjaro in? Kilimanjaro is in uh, Tanzania. So we flew, we flew Dublin, Lisbon, Lisbon, Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa to Kilimanjaro International Airport in Tanzania. Okay. Near Moshi. So you're just traveling through Addis? Yeah, just traveling okay. through. Um, yeah, mad, mad scenes in that airport. But um, I just wanted to get something with the Ethiopian colours. The fact that it's the Jamaican colours as well is... But uh, well, they're very, very closely interlinked, yeah. Closely interlinked. But that seems to be getting all the notice, for sure. Yeah. Cool Runnings references. Are... Yeah, very good. Okay, right. Um, it, yeah. keeps, it, keeps, it keeps it linked to sport, I guess, Cool Runnings. So. Um, well, also Ethiopia, home of the world's great runners. Sorry, of course. Yes, yeah, yeah. There is that as well, so... Yeah. Uh, anyway, I was... Uh, we need to talk football because last night's remarkable scenes at the end of the Champions League games... Yeah, Spurs won, you know, Spurs come back from behind in a game that they're not very good and then they win and it's like Antonio Conte feels this weight of relief because everybody thinks he's no good in the Champions League. Yeah, he goes running down the touchline as well. Yeah, like Mourinho-esque, the, the bench empties. There's Aladdin jeans and you're like, oh, there's been a pitch invasion but it's actually Richarlison who does look like he's, he's a fan who's run on to kind of congratulate and the stewards are like, Oh, oh, it's a bit athletic to be a, no, the normal lads who are like drunkenly wandering on it's like okay fair enough Yeah. Um, and then VAR intervenes and so uh, there's like 45 minutes before VAR rules it was farcical well, um, <clears throat> I was watching it live you, so you're watching it live I, I, I'm only coming into it this morning and outside I'm uh, talking to Phil Egan Phil goal or no goal and he's like well it's no goal because the rules are the rules so he's pretty black and white about it and then he points me in the direction of a guy called Dale Johnson, at Dale Johnson ESPN, who basically spends all his time... Yeah, um, judging these things. Yeah, or like explaining why VAR was correct or why VAR made the decision they made. Yes. So what was your experience like in real time? Because you're watching on BT, and let's face it, BT football coverage is the most jingoistic yeah. football coverage in the world. <laughs> now, I don't speak Spanish, so when those um, Mexican commentators are going, go, 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 go. I imagine there's a little bit of jingoism as well. Yeah. And perhaps in, in Argentina sometimes when, when Messi's playing, Messi, 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 Messi. Of course, you know, there's a bit. Perhaps. But I still think BT, even not knowing the languages, I still think BT are like, oh yeah, we've done have a blighty. Yeah, I know. That's I, that's what you get when you're watching it. It was uh, it was Jermaine Genius on CoComs and, and I, I, I'll, I'll be nice about Jermaine, I'm going to see him in London today to interview him. So, um, yeah, I think he's fantastic. If you're watching Jermaine, you're a brilliant co-commentator. But I understand what you're saying. Because in the audio, it's funny how in in the, in the so I've just watched back the the live scenes on. Yeah. Um, he's clearly saying that goal that ball goes stand. backwards. It has to stand. So there's something in his head that makes him think he's like that. That's the rule. Yeah. Well, or, well, or that he's explaining in the hope that it's. You know, yeah. putting it out there, manifesting into the world that this is going to be a goal, it's going to stand. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no, a bit, there, I, I'm saying there's a wrinkle of doubt in his mind. But even as soon as the, the so the, the first thing for, I got from watching live was three and a half minutes felt like, it just felt like forever. And you're thinking, this is the longest VAR decision there's ever been. Spurs fans are going around, they're, they're still hugging and clapping hands and Harry Kane is smiling. They all think this is going to be allowed and it's just a, a basic check just in case for anything. But um then it's given, then it, it pops up the two lines, the red line and the blue line. You're like, Whoa. It's offside, but how could it be offside? Because he's headed the ball backwards or sidewards, Emerson Royal. It's been deflected forward towards Harry Kane. But then apparently the rule is if Harry Kane is standing ahead of um, the ball, it doesn't matter if the ball was passed backwards or forwards. Well, I, I understand that. I, I, that, bit, I, that bit's fairly understandable. Sorry, that bit's okay, yeah. yeah like, I, but that seems to be the confusion. Like the, uh, why, the direction of the ball... And if was you, Harry... I thought he was behind the ball. If you're yes. behind the ball, you're onside. But is, according is, to the lines, his right knee seemed to be just ahead of the ball at the at that time. Yeah, I think it, it looks like it's his left knee. And left knee. This one here. The, your man, um, Dale Johnson, at Dale Johnson ESPN on Twitter, has the screen grab. The trouble with the screen grabs is, right? Like, 
is the is the computer so sharp that it knows the precise moment the ball is no longer in contact? Like this not, was my argument with my brother last night. No, not a not like a, a scintilla. Not yeah, like how does the computer an electron know? worth of the ball is still touching the forehead of Emerson? Yeah, because that's the important part here. It's it's such a margin, and as we were saying earlier, like the, the the result would have meant Spurs qualified automatically or qualified for the last sixteen last night with a win. A lot of money. I mean, a lot of money, and and they, now they go into the last game. I mean. Everything is to play for in that group. Everyone is so tight. There's two points separating uh, top from bottom. So all of a sudden, you're looking at it going, Jesus, they could they could not qualify. They could finish third and get Europa League. Or they could still, uh, fair enough, qualify and, and we'll all forget about this this uh, VAR mess. But, uh, so they're, t- they're top of the group as it stands, Top right? of the group as it stands. Yeah, they have eight points. Sporting have seven. Frankfurt have seven. And Marseille have six. So Marseille are still in it. And I'm just trying to check. It's Marseille. Final, it's Marseille. It's Spurs, Marse- Marseille away. It's in the Spurs. south of France. Next Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock. I mean... England and Marseille. <laughs> you can just see it. Nothing ever goes bad in Marseille for, for England. Never. No, never. Of course, they've no history there whatsoever. Um, I, look, I don't... I, in the moment when I was watching BT afterwards and Rio Ferdinand and Peter Crouch are in the studio with Jake and uh, they're trying to make sense of it all. Rio's drawn lines and they're, they're, I guess, lamenting the fact that here they are for minutes and minutes on end talking about drawing lines on a screen as opposed to talking about the Marcus Edwards' lovely goal for Lisbon. Well, like um, they don't, they're choosing to do that, though. Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. the des- decision of the director and the producer and the uh, the people in the studio. They're like... Yeah, because everyone was confused. No one knew what the crack was. Eric Dyer was saying to the referee afterwards, the ball went backwards. Um, it appeared even Matt Doherty listened to him afterwards, didn't seem to understand the rule, how it, how it was ado- uh, you know, well, taken on board. I, I, well, the way it's been explained is like, uh, um, was he behind the ball? No, he wasn't behind the ball. So he, wasn't, he was ahead of the ball. According to the screen grab, he was yeah. ahead of the ball. And so therefore, that's relatively straightforward, right? That's fair. Yeah, yeah. Um, my my the the issue I guess is the margins. It's so tight that yeah. I I don't understand how you can actually. That's the bit, right? But if if they if if we accept that the line is being drawn week in week out, and some weeks is going for you and some weeks is going against you, they're the rules of engagement. Yeah, and oh, like you know, uh, you have to assume that the technology will get better and better and better, and the... some form of AI will intervene to go well. If I if the ball comes off at this pace. Yeah, off the heads. There's a calculation of time, speed, and distance. It, it's clearly no longer. Yeah. But what if what if you're like header and it doesn't? It's not a cushion header. It's like a power header, and you're like, do you know what I mean? I know, and the ball stays in your head for longer. Yeah. Like, the the issue is is when you don't you don't know when to celebrate. Like Rio Ferdinand says, if he was a footballer now and he scored a last minute winner, he wouldn't celebrate because he would just wait because he'd assume something was going. I don't think. Up. I don't think Rio has the self control for that. No, I don't think so. Uh, I'm not sure about that, Rio. I think you might be lying to yourself. See, I think fans are split as well. Like I, I was, I'm of the opinion that you can't. It does take away from those moments. Like I, I, I was in, in Old Trafford last year when Ronaldo scored late winner against Villarreal. I was there when he scored late winner against Atalanta. And both times you're kind of looking around going, yeah, you're, you're celebrating yeah. the moment. No, it's true. It definitely takes you out of... But my that. brother and dad both think, oh no, the VR, the three and a half minutes adds to the drama. If it was five minutes, it'd be even better. I mean, um, but I, I have a certain, I have a certain like, I mean, watching those scenes this morning, knowing what was going on, I'm like, oh, that's very funny. That is, <laughs> I'm not a Spurs that. fan and I understand. So... Bobby Dwyer, resident Spurs fan on OTBM, says, uh, never mind Dale Johnson, an absolute joke of a decision. VAR is ruining football. A clear and obvious decision shouldn't take five minutes. Even the offside decision was too tight to be conclusive. Like, the too tight to be conclusive thing is important. It is It yeah. is absolutely... However, you have to assume that technology is good now. It'll get better and it'll become great eventually and we'll suddenly... Uh, there will be a point where it's like, oh, you're offside, you're offside, you're offside. Yeah. I think we're going to get to the stage where players are going to be... Like, there'll be some kind of red around the stadium that goes you're offside you're in an offside position as I, in the goal line technology kind of quick it, well I, as in that there'll be there'll be live signifiers telling players you're in an offside position oh yeah but I, the other thing like the uh, because the deflection isn't deliberate he, yes. his, his it, it doesn't that doesn't count I'm kind of like should that rule not be because if that the not defender box? had purposely passed it back towards their goalkeeper then if he, if he passed it back and it would have been fine totally I kind of feel okay, like even though Kane, yeah, even though Kane was an offside position, because if, it, if the defender had headed, if the defender had hand, handled the ball, yeah. it would have been a penalty, even though it was unintentional. So why is the ball coming off him? Why does that not reset things? And that would have been made it a goal. I, like it's definitely worked. The, the, the it was it nearly it nearly mirrored the scenes. In fact, the scenes with Atletico were even more ridiculous last night. So they, they well, drew it by Leverkusen, and the two-two a win would have kept them in the hunt. Um, so they, now they're in the Europa League. They're in the Europa League. The final whistle goes. It's 2-2. Uh, 
Roughly blow, referee blows the final whistle, everyone starts shaking hands, and then he goes, Oh, hold on, I need a check for a handball here. He runs over to the screen, sure enough, penalty for Atletico. I uh, can't remember who took the penalty, it was a horrendous penalty. Keeper saves it, rebound off the crossbar from another player, and then the third it's shot. Niguez with the one off the crossbar. Yes, and then the third shot that the, the penalty taker himself got in the way and blocked the ball off the line, essentially. So, However, Phil was saying this outside as well, the, the article when it comes to this stuff, uh, it didn't matter. As soon as the penalty is taken... That was and, the game and, over. Yeah. So, I was wondering that. Like, what would have happened was they would have scored, gone that, for the mad celebration, <laughs> and then the referee would have went, oh, sorry lads, uh, it's 2-2. Two, two. Is that... Because is that, is that, the game was over. Yeah, like, yeah. With the last, This is the last kick of the game. and So it's like a penalty in a penalty shootout. You can't, you can't be running in scoring the rebound in a shootout. The referee would have explained that to the players before they all, all went running in for rebounds. And I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a good point. And why we should mic up players and, and uh, referees and let the referee tell exactly everybody what's going on in yeah. the um, in the system. Uh, why did it take so long to see Kane was offside? Are they using a Sinclair ZX Spectrum? Asks Chris Kyle. That is a, an excellent late 80s, early 90s reference that has gone straight over the head of most people. But I 100% got it. So I'm here for you, Chris Kyle. Uh, Danny Mac one says the Monaghan Nidge. Ah, really? It was a going, lads. Yeah, that's my best. That's my best. I can't do any better than that. I'm sorry, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. Was it was Nidgey into his um his Nidgey garish his tractor tops? Probably was. Yeah, the, the oh, kind of retro right. retro vibes. Yeah. yeah. So I'll take that. I've, I've been called worse. And uh, in his luxury vehicles, uh, the All Stars, the Kelly Football All Stars, are out. Mm-hmm. We got fourteen out of fifteen yesterday. Well, Tommy got fourteen out of fifteen. I would have got about thirteen or twelve. Same. Yeah. Well, I would have put Shane McGuigan in. So, uh, who who did we miss? Uh, it was Tom O'Sullivan, uh, who everyone I thought was a shoe, not a shoe in, but uh, he had a fantastic year for Kerry. And look, they still got seven out of the fifteen All Stars. Um, Probably like the thing I uh, probably went against Tom was, well, a he has two All Stars previous, so we won't be too disappointed. But I think you'd be pretty still want to get more. I know, yeah. but but uh, Shane Walsh had a had a uh, clearly an excellent game on Tom in the final. Um, maybe that took away from it, as you said, did the semi finals and finals are they worth twice as much? Did did that take away from Tom this year? It, I think it's a, uh, when it comes down to marginal decisions, uh, not going up against the best, but you get punished for like not going up Bravery. against the best. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, there's definitely it's double edged sword. Yeah, like you have the likes of uh, Graham O'Sullivan and Brian Bugley for for Kerry as well, who, who like, weren't really in the conversation, but can consider themselves as having a good year and being relatively unlucky not to get in there. I'll do the full team really quickly: the Shane Ryan, uh, Kerry first All Star, Chrissy McCaig first All Star, thirty three, totally deserved. Yeah. I think Chrissy McCaig has literally put down one of the great GAA careers, and um, it's going to be very interesting to see what Chrissy does in his uh, post playing career as well. Jason Foley. Uh, Full back Liam Silk ends up getting cornerback Tyke Morley of Kerry again his first All Stars Liam Silk and Jason Foley everybody's first so far. John Daly is named at six and Gavin White is named at seven. I think Gavin White might have been missing from the uh, football pod. Yeah, and then after that was exactly as expected. Connor Glass and Killian McDade both getting their first All Stars. Paulie Clifford getting his second. Sean O'Shea his second. Kieran Kilkenny getting his sixth All Star. That is um, a Hall of Fame career. Uh, David Clifford. At 23, getting his fourth All Star. Jesus, how many will he what get? About that? Four. How many will he get? <sighs> so is it? Does Tommy Tommy Walsh have nine and Pat Spillane have nine? Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, ah, oh, he'll he'll beat it, won't he? I mean, Conor McManus has had an extraordinary career and he has three All Stars. And Clifford's 23 years of age and he has one Four. more one more than him now. Yeah, Damien Comer getting his first All Star at 28 and Shane Walsh at 29 getting his first All Star. So. Uh, all those Kildare lads in your late 20s don't worry about it you still have time but you better you know, get the finger out lads this is your year yeah. don't, don't yeah. winter too well no counties take great pride in this because it was an Ian Burke got it in 2018 for Galway and before that I think it had been 15 years since their, their last one um, <clears throat> so everyone in Galway would be delighted with the five. Uh, five five is about right for Galway I was concerned that maybe someone like Homer look I was I was obviously putting forward you were arguing against for, him yesterday you were concerned that maybe you're well, no I was arguing against Kilkenny <clears throat> okay fair enough but, okay. but, I, but I said Homer should be in there and, and maybe McGuigan like McGuigan's unlucky <clears throat> uh, Ryan O'Neill is unlucky um, <clears throat> Ethan Rafferty in goals probably pushed Shane Ryan fairly far but it's hard, it's hard to argue with sorry I'm, I'm, I've, I was completely incorrect I, I'm, I'm in, named Tommy Walsh and Pat Spillane who both had nine that was correct DJ Carey has nine right however Somebody else has to have a record. Henry? Henry has 11. Right. 11 All-Stars. <clears throat> so what do we have? Four for... Uh, Four for Cliff Dog. So he's got to get another seven. And he's 24. 
Yeah, so and if he plays till he's what? He's got to play to 33 and, and win it every year to to go too clear. And, he will and win it every year. He, well, there could be down years, you know, injury is the thing. Well, injury. Like, That's Henry, the only way he Henry won't had, win one. Henry had an ACL, but did, did he win it that year? He might have because it was only... Uh, the, when was he... He just needs to be fit and Kerry... But the next go- year, the ACL would have had the most impact. It probably was. Yeah, yeah. I, even if Kerry make a quarterfinal or semi-final and he plays uh, every game, they'll, he'll still get an all-star because he's that good. Gooch won eight. Uh, yes. there's, there's, he's alone on eight. And then JJ Delaney, Noel Skihan, Mikey Sheehy and Jimmy Barry Murphy have seven. And Jimmy Barry's are football and hurling. <laughs> they should count double, in fairness. If you get one in two sports, you, we should be able to uh, double those up. Uh, all right. Is there any anybody having any complaints of that? I'm, I'm really. I don't think so. I think the arguments are, are fairly like you can argue certain positions, of course, but it's it's just a matter of opinion. It's uh, as as Eamon Fitzmaurice said, it's probably not the most controversial of all star picks this year. Like as I said, Ethan Rafferty had an unbelievable year. Ryan O'Neill as well. Shane McGuigan, uh, Graham O'Sullivan, Brian O'Biogli, uh, Tom O'Sullivan. We mentioned all can consider themselves unlucky. James McCarthy, you you, you spoke about yesterday. Um, but you can't argue against any of the players that have been picked. And some years, some years, some years that is the case. Um, you, you look at the team and you're like, okay, well, how did they get in um, over them? But no, that's not the case this year. It's All right. Well, I, the way this always works is that the partisan people, fans of certain counties, are always going to be massively oh, yeah. upset. So yeah, you know, get your anger out with us. We're happy. We're here for you this morning. Oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty is the text number. Or of course, you can always get us on YouTube comments uh, Josh Dittle's going to join us in just a second uh, fresh from beating England yesterday in the cricket Michael Verney's going to join us in studio at 10 past 8 we do the same for the football for the hurling we did for the football and we'll talk to him about Davy Burke being named as the new Ross Common Boss as well Joey Malone uh, Shelburne assistant manager going to talk to us about the conclusion of the National League this weekend there's a possibility of a three way playoff and you had to be there this year this week is Paddy Agnew the legendary Italian football correspondent, ex of the Irish Times, who is going to um, talk about being there for some of the best football occasions that there have been in European football over the last half decade or so. Now, to Australia, I'm delighted to say Josh Little is with us. As I said, fresh or not so fresh today after having beaten England in the cricket yesterday. Josh, how are you getting on? Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, Yeah, I'm good. I had a nice day today just to sort of soak it all in and be around the guys and sort of enjoy the moment, I guess. So obviously for us, we're watching here this, this time, 24 hours ago, uh, praying for the rain to come, uh, a very unusual Irish situation, or at least for it not to not to stop. What time of the day is it for you guys at that point? Like what happens immediately afterwards? After after the rain? After the match yesterday. We're like, what, what, like after is, the match? Yeah, do you all sit yeah, back it's... and watch it again? Or is it like, well, we need to celebrate uh, the moment? Well, we, we head into the change rooms and um, we sing the national anthem together in a puddle and grab a bite to eat and maybe a beer for a couple of people and just soak in the moment while while watching the highlights on the TV. There's usually a TV in the change room when you're in there. So, yeah, just trying to soak up the moment as much as possible and just enjoy, enjoy it. Does it sink in straight away that, OK, this is like a very, very good England uh, T20 team? And we didn't, it wasn't a fluke. Like, I, I'm kind of joking about praying for the rain, but like, you put yourselves in a winning position. England knew exactly what they had to do and they couldn't do it. Yeah, it's it's one of those ones where I guess absolutely delighted with the win and, you know, you're sort of not expecting that. But at the same time, me personally anyway, I sort of have the mentality of, well, I'm not I'm not surprised because we're, we're a good side and, and, you know, we can beat anyone on our day. So it's sort of exciting to see what the future holds in terms of the next couple of games um, in the coming week so yeah I'm just absolutely buzzing to get stuck into those games because anything really is possible from here When did that confidence hit you about that this team being good enough to compete at this level and to pull off that victory because you know the, the, the form has been in and out over the last 18 months there's been some really really great performances and there's been some letdowns you'd have to say and yeah. so to get to this stage in this competition in this format what was giving you that confidence? I think just just having played a decent amount of that format of cricket, I just sort of understand that things don't always go your way, and that there are good days and bad days. It's just about keep working hard, and and you'll have more good days than bad days. And, and thankfully, we're starting to see the or reap the rewards for all our hard work, and it's it's just great to see. And as I said, you you don't know what the future holds for us because things are going great at the moment. 
what did it mean, Josh, for you to, to do it in the MCG as well? I mean, such a such a historic venue. I was listening to to your captain speaking the other day after the match, and he was talking about the fact that you all did a, a museum tour as well. And, and I know it's the the setting of Ronnie, Ronnie Delaney's gold medal for Ireland back in the Melbourne Olympics years and years ago. Yeah. So it must have made it all the more special. Yeah, we we were actually watching the India Pakistan game a couple of days ago, where there was a hundred thousand people and never seen the place so full and obviously that was our first time there so we were all absolutely buzzing to get out to such a famous ground and, and put on a show against what was obviously an incredibly strong English side so we were all absolutely buzzing to get out there and uh, so thankful it went went our way and it was a great day. You're uh, you're like you're, you're only what 22 at the minute Josh is it? 22, 23 next week. And yet you're you're a veteran of the team like you made your debut at, at, at 16 uh, back in 2016 so you, you're one of the older guys on the team now. <laughs> Happy birthday, by the yeah. way. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess I'm a young guy, but also an old guy. And mm. I, I'm sort of, I've, I've sort of taken the role of trying to take the guys who, who may not necessarily be the same age as me, but might be a little bit newer into the team, sort of take them under my wing a little bit and sort of try to give some of the knowledge that I've got over the years um, playing in pressure situations and trying to help the guys grow um, the way I have, play, I guess, playing against these quality opposition. What what's going through your head with those two quick wickets yesterday? I mean, is it are you allowed to enjoy the moment? Are you able to enjoy the moment? Or are you just thinking, right, let's get the next one going here? Yeah, I, I'm always trying. I'm trying to enjoy every second I'm out there. That's, that's the reason I play. Um, I try to bring a relaxed environment to the team. I'm quite a relaxed, relaxed guy and chill guy. And you know, some of the guys are a little bit more nervous or, or you know whatever you want to call it. So I try and just calm everyone down, slow it down, and just. Yeah, sort of just be in the moment a little bit and 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 to see what's in front of you. When you when you play at that level as a sixteen year old, you're obviously already thinking, <clears throat> I want this to be to be <clears throat> my professional career. Pardon me. And so that's obviously something that that's in your head at that point. When do you realise that you're going to be able to make this your living and that it's not just going to be something that you were really good at uh, at school and really good at underage, but that actually you are going to be able to represent your country and make a living doing this? Yeah interesting question and the guys actually always ask me this one and I don't really have the answer but I guess making my ODI debut against England and getting getting four wickets there at Malahide at our home ground against England as well funnily enough um, sorry about that um, I just I don't want to say it hit me that you know I, I could potentially make a living but that, that's when it sort of dawned on me that this is an exciting sport and um, you know anything could happen if you put in the hard work and, and luckily things are going my way at the moment I'm not saying they always will but fingers crossed um, we keep going the way we are that yeah things will be good I think uh, traditionally players who showed promise like you within the Irish system would have been looking towards signing for an English county team and then who knows what the international future would have held so things have obviously changed in that pathway that you feel comfortable that you don't have to do that yeah exactly I mean I don't want to go off topic from from the Irish stuff but there, there's franchise opportunities from around the world so it's not a, It's not necessarily the be all end all. Getting over to England, what we're doing at the moment is equally as special. And, and if other things come come from that, whether it be going to other competitions around the world, well, that's just an added bonus and and one one we're all hoping to to achieve. I was interested, Josh, to, to look at comments from Andrew Balburnie as well, talking after the game, where he, he said he was looking at the the matchups before the match, and he said he he was struggling to understand how Ireland could compete with England uh, on their day if they, if every player performed, like and and they're probably one of, if not the best teams in the world at this format as well. Yeah. So, uh, how did you manage to, to to do it? I mean, was it was it a case of just being confident that that, that in those matchups you could on your on your day uh, be up there with them? Yeah, as I alluded to, just just being relaxed and believing that you, we are as good as them because I have no doubt in my mind that we are as good as them. And you know, the English boys, I don't want to say, come with a little bit of arrogance. Um, so we felt, I, I felt personally, we, we catch them on the hop a little bit, um, and we did at the beginning of our batting innings and we did at the beginning of our bowling innings. So, yeah, it makes it all the sweeter than beating beating the English lads. I'd imagine if there's 100%. that little bit of arrogance. Hundred percent, yeah. We we were just saying, did we? Were they were they being a little bit? You know, were they taking us for granted a little bit? But not that that matters. We we still went out and gave our all, and um, yeah, delighted. Um, 
I, Josh, you're, you're like the right age exactly to remember the kind of first breakthrough of an Irish cricket team onto the national sporting consciousness. Um, and there's been a couple of instances in the past, generally off the back of like uh, maybe Kevin O'Brien springs to mind in the um, in the 50s. And uh, yeah. obviously before that, we, we were uh, the Sri Lanka, that whole story, that was all amazing. So do you yeah. feel now having come th- through the system and, and watched those as a kid that were kind of ready as a country and as a sport to capitalise on this? Yeah, 100%. I think the guys are all beaming with confidence and... I, I always look back with my friend Harry, who's on the team as well. You know, I remember sitting sitting in my house at 4 a.m. watching cricket games with the lads out in, in Australia and wherever, winning games in the World Cup and just wishing I hope to be there one day. And, and now that we are, we're really soaking it in and trying to enjoy every minute. Um, also with the confidence that we are as good as anyone else in the world. And, and that's a great feeling. Um, your siblings are also pretty good at cricket. So it's obviously the main sport in the house. Yeah, it's 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 a weird one. My my neither of my parents or grandparents or anything really played cricket when we were growing up. We were more of a hockey family, um, and yeah, I was playing hockey one day, and one of my one of my friends in school, his dad just came up to me and just sort of said, "Do you want to come down and give cricket a go?" And you know, you've got hand eye coordination, and I just sort of fell in love with, fell in love with it from there. And my sister sisters followed suit. And did you fall in love with batting or bowling first? <laughs> um. I, I'm going to say bowling. I, I, I've always had an interest in batting, um, but just with the schedule and stuff, I, I, I unfortunately can't work on my batting the way I, I'm able to work on my bowling. But I'll, I'll say I like both equally as much. Uh, it turns out, though, that um, you're obviously very good at the bowling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I work on the most and that, that's what I, I, I have a passion about bowling and you know, I want to be the best in the world one day um, and that drives me every day to, to get better and better and I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Like that, that it's great to hear that because uh, that's going to be inspiring to the next generation of young cricketers. Not that you're not a young cricketer, like, you, you know, you could still be doing this in 12, 14 years time mm-hmm. at international level, it turns out, especially the way uh, sports science works and it sounds like you're looking after yourself as well. So like that level of ambition and the fact that you play for Ireland as opposed to playing for England saying that is is really inspirational for the next generation yeah 100% like as I've alluded to a couple of times like we, we, we're as good as anyone else and it's just about getting that belief getting that experience into the, the younger guys um, so they can also believe that we are at this level because I remember a time where where I didn't believe we, you know we were anywhere anywhere near the standard and playing a big team is a massive occasion and whatever, you know, I oh, will lose, but I hope we have a good game. But now it's sort of like we're at this level, we can we can compete with these boys. And, it, and it's not so much about being nervous about it anymore. It's about going out and showcasing your skills and, and really giving them a good run for their money. Uh, did you get chatting to Owen Morgan at all after the match, Josh? I know we were watching him on TV yesterday. He had a bit of a, a smirk on his face. We were trying to gauge how he, how he felt after the match. Did you get talking to him at all? No, I, I didn't. I didn't. The 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 uh, scenes of all the Irish fans as well over there, like, and and a lot of them would have kind of extended the holiday, I guess, from from Durban to get to to Melbourne as well, and spent a lot of money in the process. So it must mean so much to see a family as well, but but also just fans over there. Yeah, it's amazing. My parents are actually out here, and you know they sort of they sort of booked the trip, hoping that we would get through. But you know, always sort of said to me, "Oh, when you guys go home, we'll we'll just carry on and do a little holiday." So to actually make that a reality that. No, they're not on a holiday. They're actually coming to watch us still play in these big games. is um, is a special memory and, and and one I'll never forget. That's class. Uh, that's the type of thing parents would say to take the pressure off you. And secretly, they know uh, we're going to that England game. We've got that circle. Don't worry, it's in the MCG. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's class. That's um, that is a, a really nice story. Um, I, I mean, this is like obviously a, a more philosophical question, but like, is this is this the format that suits Ireland the best? Is this what we should? focus on into the future or can we use this to help make sure that we're really good at the 50 and eventually the test side becomes even better like do we have the resources to compete on all fronts or what's your instinct about that at the moment I think I, I think just the nature with our schedule we, we don't have that much test cricket on the schedule so it's it's naturally going to be very hard to compete with the teams who, who play 10 times the amount of test cricket that we do but both 50 over and T20 cricket we, we're we're right up there um, and we have been for a while with the 50 over stuff. We've had a good couple of years there and doing well in the T20s is actually relatively new for us. We, we were quite a weak side a couple of years ago. So um, in my opinion, uh, the white ball stuff should be our, should be our focus. Um, 
and obviously trying to over the next sort of 10 years build into test cricket well that all makes sense well you've got a newfound audience of uh, of young kids who are out in the back garden bowling and batting and um hopefully it leads to all loads more success it, it like you know Everybody here is like celebrating because we beat England. But you guys, obviously, you, first thing you talked about was like really looking forward to the rest of the competition because there are some more big scalps to take. You got the the host nation at another famous ground to look forward to. That's going to be quite the occasion. Yeah, exactly. Like we never really expected after the first the first stage of the competition to to end up here. And um, so it's just sort of a just got to roll with it and enjoy the moment and. Hopefully take another couple of scalps with us because I'm sure all those teams will have seen that game and sort of uh, been a little bit scared. Maybe we'll see. <laughs> um, uh, so anything could happen and I'm really looking forward to, to playing those big teams. You've got that experience as well, I guess, Josh, of the, of the summer series. You've, you've played the likes of India, New Zealand, South Africa and, and, and Afghanistan who are the opponents tomorrow as well. Like, will, will, will having played Afghanistan and beaten them quite recently give yourselves a bit of confidence? Like, Are, are you... Are you expecting to win heading into that that uh, next game tomorrow? Yeah, hundred percent. I I think we should be winning that game um, for sure because just the nature of the wickets. They're they're naturally quite a spin dominant team, and and the ball doesn't spin too much here. Um, and the way we bowled yesterday and and, and batted up top, I think uh, would really knock them off their seat. And yeah, I expect us to win. I saw Andrew Balburney talking about the you know hoping the hope that this could spark a golden generation again of of young Irish cricketers and uh, like the the age profile of the team is something we spoke about on the show yesterday Josh like it's like they're obviously are the young are the older uh, lads on the team as as any team would have but it is mm. when you look at the average age um, fairly positive in terms of the the amount of youth on the t- on the side yeah hundred percent as I was saying earlier you now it's it's about getting those guys into, into the pressure situation. Like, for example, Fionn Hand yesterday, just his third third game for Ireland against England. You know, it's, it's about throwing people in there and, and seeing what, what they can do. And that's what happened to me. I, I, I made my de- my ODI debut against England. I was sort of thrown into the deep end to see what I could do. And as I said, it sort of just sparked my career. So there's no reason why any young guys in our team can't be thrown in into the deep end and given, a, given it a good go. So, yeah, it's just about exposure and... You gain confidence from playing those games, so you need to, you need to give the guys the chance. You felt like, regardless of the weather yesterday, and, and like when the weather closed in, we were kind of sitting here going, "Are England coming back? Are Ireland still still at the forefront?" Like, were you confident that regardless of whether the rain had arrived, you were going to go on and win that match anyway? I guess we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask then? Uh, were you were you bowling to Ali, or or had you finished at that stage? Yeah, I bowled to Ali. Yeah. What was that like? Because he was he was pretty good. Yeah, I actually I actually played with him on a team last year, so I'd know him decently well. He's he's a very funny character, um, and he was sort of sledging me on the pitch, saying, you know, he's going to hit me for six or whatever. So I was having a little bit of banter back with him, um, but now he's obviously a class player and. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't get him out, but you know, it was good, good to bolt him. Yeah, well, because he was he was in good form, but like in fairness, you know, the rest of the uh, the England order up to that point hadn't put them in a position to win. But uh, what's that tension like when you know that the winning and losing of the match is in the next few balls, really? Yeah, it, it's quite nerve wracking because, as you said, like anything could have happened there from from when we came off. Really, at one stage, you know, they needed nearly 11 and over and I was thinking God we have this in the bag easy um, and then obviously they had a decent over where they had a 6 and a 4 and it came back down to 9 and over and I was thinking God these two could could take it away from us here which would have been absolutely devastating and then we just sort of looked up and saw those black clouds rolling in and it was it was meant to be Josh are, are you like looking at Ali in the eye are you looking at the, the batsman in the eye or is it like a kind of I'm not going to let him see anything I'm not going to there's no this the sledging is a kind of are you, are you walking away muttering to him or is it like I'm coming for you how, how aggressive does it get and how, how subtle does it need to be uh, I think it, it varies person to person between me and him it was it was before the game he, was, he just came up to me and told me he was going to smack me but you know, <laughs> it was just a bit of banter um, but yeah no, I have had times where it's gotten heated and yeah I sort of try to stay away from that a little bit I try to to just focus on on what I'm trying to do and I don't really get involved too much um, but still trying to be aggressive as I can. Yeah, well, it obviously worked out and as you said, it was meant to be. Josh, congratulations. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Thanks very much. Cheers.
It's uh, Josh Little there. He, he's uh, two sisters who play for Ireland as well. So it's uh, they're pretty good. Reasonably talented family, yeah. yeah. And being, <laughs> uh, I, we should have pointed it out there, the um, game against England where they threw him in four wickets, including Owen Morgan. Jesus. It's the, not bad, is it? The obliviousness of youth. <clears throat> I mean, they, throw them in, give them a chance. They, they don't feel nerves. Um, and it's hard to believe he's... He's so experienced in the team, as in he's, he's it's six years he's been in the team, and yet he's only 22, soon to be 23. So, uh, I mean, what an experience that is for him. And for him to remember those great moments in, in, in times past of Irish teams doing the likes of this, uh, but this probably tops the pile in terms of achievements. So, uh, and I love that little bit of sledging in cricket as well. Oh, yeah. You like to see it. Uh, five minutes past eight here this morning. Uh, Regatta Great Outdoors are launching their new Freddie Flintoff collection this autumn. And to celebrate, we've got a hundred euro Regatta voucher to give away every day, and one lucky winner will get a five hundred euro voucher. To be with a chance of winning, like and retweet our Regatta Great Outdoors social post on Twitter today on our main Twitter page. That's at Off the Ball. And remember, shop the Freddie Flintoff collection in store at Regatta Great Outdoors or online at regatta.ie. After the break, we're live with the Irish Independence Michael Verney to take us through he, who he thinks will end up being on the All-Star Hurling team, which is announced tomorrow night at the banquet. First, you might have seen this by now, but 16 of the Australian men's football team who are going to the World Cup in Qatar came together to post a video highlighting the human rights abuses in Qatar, including the treatment of immigrant workers and the LGBT plus community. Here's a snippet. We're back after this. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Red 78. I just thought they were smarter and how they, they went about their business. Nobody knows Munster rugby better. As a coach, why did they only give away nine penalties this week? As a cohesive unit, they attacked together, they defended together, and they showed a lot of intent. Available every Wednesday. Don't miss a moment of action. Subscribe to the Rugby Channel on the OTB Sports app and turn on your notifications now. The Irish Centre for Diversity is proud to launch the inaugural National Diversity and Inclusion Awards. Taking place in Croke Park on Thursday, February 2nd, the NDI Awards celebrate individuals and organisations that go above and beyond in their commitment to diversity and inclusion. Free entries close this Friday and nominations are open across 10 categories, including race and ethnicity, gender, LGBTQ+, and disability. Visit ndiawards.ie for more. And remember, closing date for entries is this Friday. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. Yeah, right. Sorry about that. The audio on the uh, Australian video didn't work. We'll um, we'll tweet it a little bit later on so you can have a look at it for yourselves. Now, a reminder, OTB AM brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at movember.com. Now, Michael Verney is with us. We're going to talk the Hurling All-Stars in a minute, but Davey Burke has been named the common Football Manager. Um, you were saying on Twitter it's a good appointment. Yeah, Davey's a very shrewd, uh, shrewd manager, shrewd coach. He had two very good years with Wicklow. That was after leading your native Kildare, obviously, to that under-20 title in 2018. Yeah. Won a county title with Sarsfields, uh, Year later, he was with Sarsfields earlier on this year and probably disappointed maybe with how they how they fared. But yeah, I don't know. He was at a, a coaching clinic recently. Really innovative coach, thinks deeply about football, watches uh, an incredible amount of football. Um, and I think it's a, I, like Ross Common were uh, kind of teetering on the edge. I would say of where they were going to go. And as regards the options that they had, to me, he was the, he was the best option. Um, it's funny. Frank Roach did a piece in our paper today. Um, and he pr- probably was leaning towards Brendan Hackett taking the job as in older managers are in vogue now again yeah. 10 years ago it was yeah. young managers yeah. you know it was early 30s uh, but Davies now like he was the youngest manager inter-county manager when he took on Wicklow in 2020 he's still the youngest inter-county right. manager now um, but could yeah. be the youngest manager for the next 20 years <laughs> but he could be but like it's, it's interesting like Conor O'Rourke is retiring yeah. Kevin McStay is retired Jack O'Connor's retired I think Jack O'Connor was the oldest All-Ireland senior football winner manager ever last year right um, and a lot of the managers will tell you now they need to be retired they need time uh, Liam Kearns is the same with Offaly uh, retired from the from the guards you need an awful lot of time uh, and I know Davey talked before about the sacrifices on his own health of being involved in inter-county management but 
like I remember chatting about that and he's going through all the negatives but if anyone's listening I, I love it you know you know what I mean and that's yeah. it and he does love yeah. it and he'll uh, Ross Common's not a million miles here. from him where, he, where he's based um, it, he was he was forced to finish football at quite a young age due to a lot of injuries and just was thrown straight into coaching and he's taken to it like a duck to water Yeah it'll be very interesting for Kildare supporters to watch how successful he is thinking you know mm-hmm. maybe maybe he should have got the job but well, it's a funny one because Roscommon are Division 1 Kildare yeah. Division 2 so he's taking a step up technically it's a good job yeah, yeah. No, I don't, I don't, no one in Kildare is looking down on Roscommon football going you know uh, we, we can't at this stage but the dream team scenario came in and that was too irresistible to the county board and I can totally understand why as well yeah. so Mark McHugh is an interesting appointment alongside him. Um, I, my wonder is, make it like twelve weeks to appoint a new manager. Like Monaghan took a long time, Donegal took a long time. But is that what it is? Just the, the time taken in terms of commitment levels is such that it's going to take two or three months for for some counties to get managers nowadays. Well, it's not as appealing maybe as it would have been before. Yeah. I think people are even though it's a shorter season, which should help. And maybe you think that's one of the reasons why maybe Jack McCaffrey and Paul Mannion are potentially back with Dublin now. But. Uh, like it is, it's a huge commitment, particularly for a younger man. And you have to be at a, a younger man or woman, you have to be at a certain stage in your life. I'd say, like, you're not going to be expecting kids, I'd say, you know, to be an inter county manager now. You just don't have time. You probably need them, need your kids to be at a certain age as well. And it's just a difficult one, yeah. Like, uh, Donegal were the goods of 120 days, I think, mm-hmm. looking forward. Uh, Roscommon were 12 weeks. Uh, I just think it's been gas. And I kind of said it at the time. You know, all the stellar tickets that were in the mix for Mayo. Uh, so only one ticket was going to get it of the four. But if you look at where the rest of the candidates have gone, there's about seven or eight involved in inter-county management, be it coaching or otherwise. So sometimes you're waiting to see what happens if you're a, in the inverted commas, Leicester County maybe, or not outside of the very, very top tier. You're waiting to see what happens in some other counties and see where some of the big hitters go and then maybe take the fall, shall we say. Yeah, and the other thing is that everybody was like, oh, this has to be, oh, you've got to appoint them now, there's club championship matches you're missing. It's like, well, okay, that's this season, but this is hopefully going to be a two slash three year appointment. Ideally, it's at least three years before somebody, so this three or four weeks that we're taking to get the decision right, in the long run, it's the right thing to get the right person yeah. as opposed to rushing in, this guy's available right now, we need to get him. Well, that's what happens in the GA, to be honest with you, because I've seen it with club managers, particularly guys that do the merry-go-round. Just say, Burr, for example, are looking for a manager, should we say, hypothetically. You'll hear all sorts of rumours about who's available and who's not, and you'll hear that a guy that might be in the mix Oh, a rival club, you'll hear some, all of a sudden a rumour will be got that this, oh no, they're after him. And then the call is made and it's like, okay, we have him, we're sorted. And then maybe six months later you're thinking, mm, maybe, maybe we should, should have waited. waited, maybe we should have just, <laughs> you know, went through the process of waiting it out a bit more. But that's what happens. But I think Ross Common have gotten a very good guy in, in Davy Burke, uh, very forward thinking coach and a guy who digests a, a crazy amount of football every weekend. He's involved with the um, Manute Sigerson team as well. Which, mm. you know, it kind of felt like the link between Kildare and Manute needs to be very solidified. It's like a big opportunity for them to use this as a breeding ground. But anyway, it's a, another day's work. So the, the hurling all-stars, the football all-stars was very, very straightforward. Tommy had 14 out of 15, correct? Is the hurling all-stars as clear-cut? Uh, it's clear-cut enough, I'd say, Jerry. yeah. Um, like Limerick are going to dominate. There's no point in saying any different, but there's, a, there's probably a couple of positions that are up for grabs. Say one half-back position that would be somewhat up in the air, maybe one midfield position. I'd say, I'd say thereafter, I'd, I'd be confident enough you'd have 13 or 14 of them, and maybe one might fluctuate. The big one for me, Jerry, is, and I'll go down through my team in a minute, but the big one for me is, uh, the cornerback position and particularly that number two shirt so this is an interesting one Sean Finn will be going for five All-Stars in a row and Sean Finn is the best cornerback in the country okay but Sean Finn and I love Sean Finn as a player but Sean Finn was not the best cornerback in the country this year so the All-Stars are picked on this year with due, with due credit to the players this year it's supposed to be yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so Mikey Butler was the be- was the best Man marking cornerback in the game this year. You're given. You're given the the. Give me one minute to get to that because yeah. I want to just go through this here, right? So the goalkeeper nominees are Aidan Murphy, Galway, Owen Murphy of Kilkenny, and Nicky Quaid of Limerick. And you've gone for Nicky Quaid. Yeah, no, I have gone for Nicky. Yeah, um, he probably doesn't get tested maybe as much as as, as the two other keepers there. Probably particularly Owen Murphy. Um, but that's just the nature of the defence guys around him. And goalkeeping is not about 
shot stopping anymore. That's a big part of it. But his distribution is his distribution is so much better than any of the other keepers there. He puts balls in positions that are so advantageous to his forwards. Um and he's just he's he's the building block. Everything starts with him. So Nicky Quaid for me there. He's pretty humble as well. I remember talking to him at various stages after all Ireland finals and he's like, uh, last couple of minutes you're just lorrying it down on top of that half forward like that is certainly easy. not the case. That's I'm definitely like, not the really? case. They don't lorry ball down, yeah. He it's it's so methodical what he does and he's the quarterback that starts every attack basically you do feel like if if it if for whatever reason it looks like he's lowering it down it's because Grod Hegarty has his hand up and it's going straight yeah, to his hand yeah. Grod doesn't <laughs> even have to jump and it's like well well that's a big help as well there's no point in saying anything it's it a big is, help having, having Hegarty Hayes and uh, Tom Morrissey there but a lot of the time there's runs been made to make space for him to put it into his job is to put it into the, those areas and do you know what it is as well it's the timing of it it's one thing putting it there but it's putting it there in the player's stride so he yeah. doesn't even have to stop yeah. um, and he does that so so good OK so I, I think you've given away who is your number two you're gone for Mikey Butler yeah Mikey Butler to me was the best uh, man marking probably defender in this year's championship it's amazing to think he was coming back from a cruciate and a, and a broken kneecap this is his first inter-county season uh, he's only about five foot seven, five foot eight max. You know that great picture of him doing the doing the water in two thousand and fourteen for Kilkenny. He was water by, and he's like he's he's pint size, and Richie Hogan is beside him, and then Lee Chin is beside him. It's like little, you know, bigger, very big, and he's made. Uh, he probably wouldn't have been well touted as a potential senior star, but he was brilliant this year. He's man the match in the Leinster final where he followed Carl Mannion a lot of the time. He kept Tony Kelly anonymous in the All Ireland semi final, and he had a good final as well. It kind of changes how you think about Kilkenny into the future having somebody like Mikey Butler come on the scene where it's like Kilkenny don't really so they've had good underage uh, talent coming through but not that type of defender who you can rely on who might be a shutdown corner yeah like Brian Cody trusted him at marking the opposition's best forward in his debut season and he was he was absolutely brilliant funny enough uh the, he did the matchups for the All Ireland final. Maybe wouldn't have suited him. Maybe someone like Galan, who's very good in the air. So he was just he was just picking up Graham Mulcahy, and I would say he he won that duel. But maybe he wasn't allowed to have the same influence as, he, as he'd had in some other games. So to me, to me, he's the he's the All Star cornerback. Yeah, well, it, it's close between him and Sean Finn. Oh yeah, it, it yeah. is close. Yeah, I'm just really interested to see whether whether legacy gets Finn over the line. And I think Finn is Finn is the best cornerback in the country. Um, but he wasn't the best cornerback in the country this year if you get me uh, you've gone for Hugh Lawler at fullback what was the competition here like uh, stiff enough yeah probably Mike, Mike Casey from Limerick would have been would have been very close Dottie Burke from Cork as well uh, Hugh Lawler came back from I think he had a broken thumb in the middle of the championship and he came back and he had a bit of trouble with Conor Whelan maybe in the first 20 minutes of the Leinster final but was brilliant thereafter he's their prototype modern day fullback he's about 6 for 4 He's fast, he's good in the air, he doesn't have a fixation with hurling a load of ball. Do you know, fullback is a stopper, mm. essentially number one. He minds the house really, really well. And he probably got the better of uh, of Aaron Galan in the All-Ireland final. Had he not, Galan would have probably been in the run for hurler of the year. So I think it should be two all Auckland Gales club men, side by side, two and three. That's pretty impressive. Uh, you've gone for Barry Nash at four. Ah, yeah, sure. He's probably changed what a modern day cornerback is now. He's like a floating cornerback. He's as much of an attacker as he is in a defend as, as he is a defender. Bombing down. When you see him raiding through, you know you're in serious trouble. I don't know if there's ever been a better distributor of a ball as a, as you know in that fullback line. Traditionally, he's just humped long and he does anything but that. And again, it's been a long time uh, before Finn last year. It had been a long time before a cornerback had been in the hurler deer conversation, and he's firmly in at this area you're That's in, the, you're in the, the cornerback fraternity yeah. Mike McInnes you're obviously going to put that argument forward like, how is that position uh, like when you think of former all-stars in that position like the likes of Ollie Canning or uh, Tommy Welch probably was picked at all-star a couple of years there as well like how has it changed is it, are, are there different attributes for a cornerback now than there was even 10-15 years ago I think the principle of being able to uh, stop your man first and foremost is still it's just about the main duty I'd say but like gone are the days where you're striking ball over the shoulder and just slurrying it down the field you have to be able to look up you have to be able to break a tackle uh, and he's as potent of a weapon a cornerback yeah. coming forward and starting an attack as any player out the field is and that's like I think it's 19 it's 30 years since Brian Corkin got hurled the year as a cornerback 
at ni- at 19 and the game has probably changed an awful lot since then and it just shows you how good he was this year for a cornerback to be in that hurler deer conversation he was outstanding from start to finish so the half there's no competition for him for Barry Nash I don't think so, no. Okay. Because generally now the way Hurling has played, there's two in the full back line now and two in the full forward line. So he kind of comes out. I think it's perfectly set up. Like I put it to you this way, when, I, when you pick an all-star team, you like it to be realistic as well. Like what would happen here is Mikey Butler and Hugh Lawler would be the two men inside and Barry Nash would be the floating one. So yeah. it, it picks itself perfectly. Well, we were talking about this with, with Tommy when we were talking about the football yesterday, is that like some players in modern football, their job is to be a sweeper and on the ball and so it's kind of easier in some respects yeah. to look great because mm. you're you're the pass before the pass that makes the goal or you're the one who like steps in and intervenes whereas uh, for Chrissy McCaig to stand out it's much harder for the yeah, man markers yeah. to stand out it's much harder oh big time yeah and in a way I don't know like maybe we need best man marker you know and you pick three of them and you're like best sweeper and you pick one I don't know I don't, I don't know how to answer but making it realistic is like yeah, well, I think you have to be picking. They have to be picking a team like you would want it to go out and play. Yeah, and I'd be more than happy to have the two lads inside and Barry Nash sweeping essentially as he does. Okay, uh, really weak full back or half back line here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dermot Burns, Declan Hannon, and Parik Mannion are your three. Yeah, this, yeah, is, this is going to be it, isn't it? This is what you think the All Star is going yeah, to. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you'd uh, you wouldn't like to be trying to penetrate that half back line as a half forward line. I wish you were trying to think how you're going to break him down. Uh, Burns was on another planet this year, boys. Like just ridiculous what he was doing. There's never been a half back that does does what he can do that can hurt you from 100, 100 110 yards. Uh, like in the first half, of the All Ireland final this year, Owen Murphy put a puck out down. Burns puts the claw up and puts it back over the bar. Like you know. Kilkenny are gone from being on the attack to, you know... It's negative. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. And so, so quickly. And it's such a crisp striker, the ball as well. Like, when you're playing Limerick now, you're trying to think, how are we going to stop Dermot Burns hitting us for three or four points from wing back? And Tipperary actually did it really well this year. They almost shoveled a lot of bodies to his wing so that he never got a clean strike away. Yeah. And they managed to keep him off the ball. But he's, yeah, and his free-taking ability, they just they just trust him from anywhere inside 120 yards, I'd say. And it's not just the freeze that's going to make him hurler of the year if he is hurler of the year. It's it's the all-round game. Oh, yeah, big time. Um, I was chatting to Cyril Farrell about him last night because I'm just doing a piece for the paper on Saturday and he just said, the one thing in college with me also, he was always so mad to attack the ball, attack the ball. And half-backs a lot of the time now, you see it at club level a lot of the time, their first duty is to stop the ball just stop it going through and he does that brilliantly but not only does he stop it or break it down he usually brings it on with him as well so there, he's gone from his def- main defensive duties to stop it perfect but then he brings it forward and sets up an attack and his ball inside to the forward line is class and his work alongside Hannon like those two guys are just like two peas in a pod there and link so unbelievably well I was reading um, John Fogarty uh, last night from earlier in the year where he was picking his July All-Stars at that particular juncture and he had, he had Burns, Hannon and then Paddy Deegan of Kilkenny at left wing back. Like, he had a great year as well but mm. it's hard to argue with the final three. Yeah, you, you see some of the names in that list that don't make the, the half-back line you're like, Jesus, this is yeah, strength yeah. and depth there. Like. Yeah, Paddy Deegan probably suffered from the fact that he had to mark Groot Hegarty in the yeah. Ireland final realistically uh, but Parik Mannion to me it, this year was back to his form of 17 and 18 when he was uh, really in his pomp and particularly when they were struggling even in the Leinster final against Kilkenny when they were there was a sinking ship in the last 20 minutes he was still the one leading the fight and same against Limerick this year Do the, do the finals and semi-finals like we were talking yesterday do they count for, for double in your in your mind like Thomas Sullivan very unlucky to miss out in the football all-stars well, Positive and it, negative right Well like, yeah and, but Mark and Shane Walsh in the final probably similar to, to yeah. Deegan probably did him out of an all-star potentially yeah, actually, sure you don't know yourself, but most of the stock is placed on the semi final and final, realistically. Yeah. And that's why we move to someone like Tony Kelly in a minute. That's why there's the potential for him to be left out because he's such a quiet semi final. Mm. But, but like you can't forget what happened in Munster before that when yeah. he was on and probably on another planet to any other player in the province, realistically. But there is an awful lot of stock placed on it. Yeah, I do feel for the defender who is on a team that is so good and has been brilliant all the year and then is trusted in the final to go up against the best hurler in the country you know putting in an all time great performance and you're like well you can't be an all star because you were but I, I stood I tried like I you know I was good enough to be considered for that role you know yeah no I get you yeah it's not simple yeah anybody else who is close to getting into that half back line or full back line uh, Dermot Ryan from Clare would have been close in my view anyway um, again another player who when Kilkenny were battering him in that semi-final he was kind of 
he was standing up I think he had a couple of points for play that day he was good in the Munster final as well see it's funny it depends and we're talking there about what duties you get depends on what duties you get in a given yeah. day sometimes like Dermot Ryan you could maybe say had a quiet enough Munster final but he was dueling with Tom Morrissey at times he was dueling with Gerard Hegarty at times if you're not touching the ball it's not necessarily a bad thing as long as they're not touching like Gerard Hegarty had a quiet Munster final I think he was on McInerney from Osford Tom Morrissey it was good in the Munster final, but they had a good battle. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you're not going to get that eight or nine out of ten performance. Yeah, and look for when it comes to the the midfield. That's I think that the whole point is like, what is the role of the midfielder? So the nominees for midfield: David Fitzgerald of Clare, Ryan Taylor of Clare, Tom Monaghan of Galway, Darth Fitzgibbon of Cork, uh, William Dunhu of Limerick, and Adrian Mullen of Kilkenny. Mullen's in your team, and Joseph Cooney's in your team. Yeah, I've gone. I've gone a bit rogue there. I've You're going to get in trouble here now. Yeah, not, not nominated in midfield, <laughs> but uh, uh, well, it's, uh, the thing is, right? He played half back at times. He played midfield at times, and he played half forward at times. Um, midfield is not that definite. Like to be honest, Adrian Mullen didn't play midfield a lot of time for Kilkenny either. He no. played half forward. He was an outlet at middle of the field when they were breaking out of defence but he wasn't playing midfield a lot of times so to me midfield is, is fluid enough this is the one where I've probably gone for personal preference here uh, rather than what I actually think it will be I think more than likely David Fitzgerald will get picked midfield alongside Adrian Mullen which I just thought Joe, Joseph Cooney had an unbelievable year um, getting on the scoreboard a lot and he's a real utility player as well when when uh, Gerard McInerney went off in the All-Ireland quarter final he went back centre back and just slotted in seamlessly uh, I thought he was brilliant Jerry's very good against Limerick as well but he's unlikely to get it well that's the thing isn't it so if you if you do really well and you, you're like a Jenga piece or a, um, a Swiss army knife that they, they move around then you, you get punished when it comes to the selection for this mm-hmm. and that's also not fair like I don't know is there a way around this where you know there's a mark given properly that takes into account possessions blocks hooks you know how often you are free on the ball as opposed to like have this good instinct he showed up on the highlights I know what you mean trying to add a bit of science to this it's, but it's impossible it's, and, it, and it's adding science to what's such a subjective exercise really and it does come down to personal preference and personal I'll opinion take the fun out of it too much science <laughs> take the fun out of it you need a bit of artistic poetic license and kind of pick your own people like you know I put, I put together a piece last year on the, the goalkeeping position and got a lot of really interesting stats to show who should have been the all-star goalkeeper and I thought it was and I've Brilliant time for Owen Murphy. I think he's probably the best keeper of his generation. But you know, a lot of the stats pointed in Nicky Quaid's favour, particularly with what he was doing when he had the ball in his hand, and he didn't get the All Star. <laughs> so yeah, well, so Cooney could get out of the reckoning because he was man of the match at centre back. Maybe not have been man of the match, but it was sensational there. But it's like, well, he didn't do his best stuff at centre back, and we can't put him in centre back. Yeah, can't yeah, put yeah. him in midfield because he was. You know, like, but if yeah. Colin Cavanagh can get picked in the football at full back a number of years ago, then. Why can't they? they? I mean, they can switch it around. I think when that happened, I think there's license to put anybody anywhere. Really, <laughs> yeah. like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you think it's going to be David Fitzgerald and Adrian Mullen? Adrian Mullen, close enough to a shoe in? Oh, he's an absolute shoe in. Yeah, uh, probably had a quiet All Ireland final by his standards, but before that, um, he I think he must have had the guts of about twenty points from playing this year's championship. He's there, was, there was pressure on him. Like I definitely remember pre pre um, tournament, we were talking. I think it was um, with Paul Murphy, and it was like. Been a lot of talk about Adrian Mullen. He's been injured for a while. This is it now. He needs to stand up and be one of the leaders of the team. And then, like, three, four points from play every game. Yeah. Showing for ball and actually really stood up to it. Yeah. And, like, he's probably what's he's probably the one player that's going to lead Bally Hale, I'd say, forward for the next 10 years as well. I was chatting Jackie Tyrrell about this and he was kind of saying, when you look at the, the Bally Hale journey, he said it started with Henry. I would say the relatively recent generation has passed on to TJ and he thinks it's passed on to Adrian Mullen now. And you're talking about pressure being on him. Like, he's what? He's, no more than 23 I'd yeah, say yeah. like it's mad like really can I go to bat for Willow Donoghue here like in the Piercing and Limerick people are going to be uh, getting in touch like he's he's unbelievable uh, the John O'Shea potentially of this all-star selection like, fairly underrated um, probably should get one but will he I think you've even done him a disservice there. Uh, Sorry, Patrick, yeah. Patrick Vieira is what I'd nearly yeah, associate yeah. more with. And this is another thing. I think Willow Dunne, who's the best midfielder in the country. Right. But I don't necessarily think he was the best midfielder. This, like, I think he's head and shoulders above the rest of the midfielders in the country, if I'm honest. But again, he does a lot of the, of the less glamorous work, shall we say. He does a lot of the spoiling. Yeah. Um, need, we need a science to take that yeah. into account. Now, like, I, now, I think yeah. he did the same last year, but was probably more effective, if you get me. Um, but... I take your point Shane if they're looking at picking definitely an out and out midfielder yeah. who definitely played midfield all year there's a possibility that he could slip in there definitely and like 
I've went to bat for him more than anybody. Like he was, he was absolutely uh, robbed in 2020 of an All Star. Uh, so he should definitely should have two to three under his belt already. Uh, that wouldn't be a massive departure if they picked him. But on this year's form, I'm not sure. Do you think the All Star committee picks uh, based on that? Like even Thomas Sullivan has two already, so they're thinking, oh, maybe we'll we'll give someone else one, and will it will? I mean. You know, could they give one to him this year, given that he, he did miss out, as you say, in years where he probably could have got one? Do you think that comes into the reckoning at all? Like the, or is it solely based on the year? We never know. We don't know the behind the scenes how these are things are picked. But uh, I've, I've talked to some people who've been in the room. Of course, yeah. Apparently, it's less it's less fractious than it used to be, because they can't smoke anymore, and I'm not sure they can drink anymore. <laughs> no, they <laughs> right? can't. No, no, they can't. Crack no. Sure, yeah. Back in the day, apparently, it was um, they would have lasted. A long time. Yeah, but we're all, Shane, on that point, we're all like human, like the same as referees, like, yeah. you know, it's very easy to, you know, think of that, oh, you missed out, maybe we, we were wrong a couple of years ago, you know, that's that's the way life works. Like. Yeah, yeah I, I, my, my biggest thing for all this is, uh, I thought Aidan Omani was in the, should have been in the conversation for Man of the Match in the All-Ireland Final when he marked uh, Michael Murphy out. Oh, yeah. Didn't get a mention, didn't get an All-Star that year. And I'm like, that's the hardest job. M- Murphy at that stage was the best footballer in the country. Mm had not the impact in the Ireland final that he should have had because somebody does one job better than anybody else is able to do it. That for me is an all-star and it's, it's your point about like that unseen stuff and that's where there's no science to this but if your job is to find space and you're actually the extra forward who plays as a third midfielder yeah. and you're scoring three or four points maybe you should be scoring seven points. Yeah. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you, yeah. have, you have You have... 12 chances and you score four points and everyone's like yeah but we forget the wides really yeah yeah but I, I'm going to always bat like as a cornerback down through my years like unless someone watches a game close to you you never get any credit yeah. so I'd always bat for the lads who do the less glamorous jobs <laughs> and would say the likes of an O'Donoghue or an Aidan O'Mahony that's the reason Kerry probably won the All-Ireland lads in 2014 realistically like yeah. and unless you're looking close to the ad and you see how he's spoiling how he's tracking every run you're not going to take into account just how good he was in that given day. That, that sort of thing annoys me, I have to say. The half-forward line, you've got Garrod Hegarty, Kyle Hayes and Shane O'Donnell. I think maybe people are sleeping a little bit on how good Shane O'Donnell was this year as well. O'Donnell was brilliant, particularly coming back from uh, you know, his concussion issues and wondering whether he'd ever get back playing club hurling, let alone county hurling. Uh, again, when they were struggling, like he was brilliant when they were going well and that's fine, but I'd always look at a guy when their team isn't going particularly well they were struggling against Wexford in that quarter final he came up with three to four points at the end of that game you know they were being tanked by Kilkenny in the other semi-final and he was still the one that was taking it to them um, I think he's an absolute chew in I have to say and obviously Hegarty scored 1-5 in the other final was in the reckoning before that has scored three fourteen from playing his last three other final appearances has saved the best to last uh, that All Ireland final display this year I'd put up against any display in an All Ireland final just for from second one to the last second it was near perfection and then you're looking at Kyle Hayes who like Kyle Hayes is the best wing back in the country at seven like he Dermot Burns offers one thing Hayes offers a completely different thing he's a marauding wing back but he went up centre forward and just like in 2018 when he got young hurler of the year he was one of the big one of the big differences like he gave four points in the All-Ireland final as well Is there anybody close? Tom Morris he's always close in, in that sector again another guy who uh, probably he's not been talked about this year as much because he wasn't on the scoreboard maybe as much as he as he had been. He's definitely he's definitely close and in the reckoning there. But I, you know, Shane O'Donnell is probably the one that some people would question. But to me, I think he's I think he's a lock. I have to say. Okay, uh, the full forward line is Tony Kelly. You've gone for TJ Reid and Aaron Galan. So TJ's a nominee for Hurler of the Year. So that's he's definitely going to be an All Star. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Galan was in the conversation uh, coming into the All Ireland final before he was, you know, quiet by his standards. But still ended up with three points. And just because people would say Tony Kelly didn't play corner forward, well, he played corner forward or full forward in some games. But again. Very few teams play three inside now. So he's coming out. Yeah. He's coming out to the half line. He's coming out to midfield. And people would say maybe TJ didn't play inside. He played inside enough. He played corner forward in the All-Ireland final for large, large stages. And Galan was nearly always inside. Um, Galan's just so dangerous in the air. It's funny, I was chatting Kieran Carey about this recently. He said that Aaron Galan wasn't actually that good in the air until he really went after that. He was obviously good at ball on the ground and they really went after it uh, after it in training with the well, with Patrick's well. And he just he just got yeah. it really, really yeah. quickly. And now he's probably, you know, one of the best in the air and he just drifts in behind. And if you let him drift in behind and he catches it, it's probably a goal straight away. Okay, who's close in that full forward line then that might get in ahead of, well, 
Is it Tony Kelly who, who's at danger here? Tony Kelly is probably the one most at risk, I would say. Um, Conor Whelan from Galway wouldn't be a million miles away. Uh, just probably because they were beaten in Leinster and didn't make it to the all Ireland final, he's probably going to be overlooked, but he, he had some great tallies, particularly he was very good in that Leinster final when nobody else was playing well until Hugh Lawler literally, literally knew, all I need to do is shut this man down somewhat and nobody else is going to contribute because that's what happened on the day and Kilkenny yeah. won the game. He won't be far away. Desi Hutchinson won't be, won't be one that anyone's really going to be talking about, but Waterford had a terrible championship and he'd a brilliant championship. He scored he scored five from playoff Sean Finn when they played. Um and he got six points in their last game as Clare when nobody else performed. They probably won't be talked about, but they definitely deserve to be in the conversation. Hurler of the Year's Dermot Burns for you with the nominees TJ Reid, Dermot Burns, Barry Nash. Yeah, I think Burns hit thirty six points over the course of the summer. Um and I remember down in Limerick it was literally Burns scoring one end, uh down in Clare I should say, Burns scoring one end, Kelly scoring the other end. It was just a game uh, uh, basically a game on the scoreboard between a wing back and you know the best forward in the country yeah. um, and you know he had a really solid all Ireland final and I think I think he yeah, I think he's I'd be very surprised if it was anybody anybody else The Young Hurler of the Year Mikey Butler Owen Cody and Kieran Joyce are the nominees so you would expect because they reached the Ireland final that it's going to be between Butler and Cody is it? Yeah Cody would uh, would do something that I don't think anybody else has done he'd be hurt, young hurt of the year three years in a row if he does win it they changed it <coughs> excuse me they changed it to under 22 this year because um, probably the amount of candidates or sorry it's uh, yeah it's under 22 uh, because the amount of candidates maybe at that age weren't particularly big up until this year and then this year we had plenty of candidates it's just the way it works because maybe lads are making an impact in Inter county at a, a bit of an older age now but my worry is and I know Will O'Callaghan's probably looking I'd be wor- worried that there's going to be this Montreal screw job here where Mikey Butler doesn't get corner back but he gets Young Hurler the Year as compensation <laughs> now that's not to say the Young Hurler the Year is voted on by players but to me he's the obvious candidate and I just hope like, he gets both yeah but it's not like it's not, you know, Mikey Butler's a young lad. Oh, you get one next year. We no. don't know that. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, 2022, to me, is the best cornerback. So he deserves to be an all-star and I think he deserves to be a young hurler. Well, you could get injured, you can miss for, who knows, you know, yeah. travelling. Like. Yeah. Colin McCarthy on YouTube. Uh, Tony Kelly hasn't performed at the business end of the year, in year uh, again in this year. No impact on the quarter or the semi-final. Well, I think he hit three or four. I think he hit four from play in the yeah. quarter-final. So that's now, not bad. Yeah, he was, he was quiet by his standards, but there was generally a hangover over the whole Clare team after that Munster final. There's another thing as well, lads, is that when a team really throws it down to Limerick, they seem to be have an inability to back it up because whatever uh, whatever effort it takes, if you look at Kilkenny in 2019 when they beat them, the last championship defeat they've had, they couldn't back it up in the All-Ireland final. Mm-hmm. Look at Clare in the Munster final this year, couldn't back it up against, backed it up somewhat against Wexford, uh, you know, very poor against Kilkenny. You look at, uh, there's a couple of more teams even that have thrown it down to them and whatever it is, the toll it takes, yeah. they can't back it up. Uh, it makes sense, you know, they're, that's why they're the greatest team potentially of all time. They're on track for it anyway. They're getting there, yeah. Michael, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. We'll, Cheers, um, we'll find out on Friday evening exactly how those two teams match up. A reminder, OTBIM brought to you with Gillette in association with Movember Effortless Shave, Magnificent Mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. Up next, we're live with the Shelburne Women's Assistant Manager, Joey Malone, ahead of an absolutely massive weekend of National League action. We'll hear why with Joey. Before that, Joe, Mick and Richie were on last night's news round discussing the issue of how 15 grand simply isn't enough for the women's professional contracts in Irish rugby. Yeah, the IRFU reportedly struggling to get women's 15s players to accept the union's professional contract offers. Back in August, the IRFU announced it will be offering 43 centralised contracts. Those operating in the sevens programme were already under contract and it was the first time that women playing the 15s format were offered professional terms by their own union. As you mentioned, Rory O'Connor's piece claimed that of the 18 full-time contracts offered to 15s players, only seven have been taken up. Some players are believed to have been offered just €15,000 plus incentives to put pen to paper. Yeah, the €15,000 figure certainly catches the eye. Now, Rory's piece did say that uh, several players had certainly been offered uh, more money in line with what other countries were paying their female players at the moment. But certainly, you're not surprised to see the uptake on giving up my professional career to take 15 grand a year is being turned down and since I think the players will have public backing and they should dig in for the best possible contracts and the IRFU will be forced to pay up. It's a ridiculous point as well for a couple of reasons but one of them is that you know this is the standard of the game so we either don't have a women's team or we have to make it professional and that has to be competitive enough for people to sign the contracts. Mm. 
and actually play. So, like, I think 15 is is a unfortunate number because those incentives, I'd imagine an awful lot of them are... It's a low end, obviously. Yeah, it is. And the incentives would, you know, hopefully bring it up to some sort of, uh, you know, at least a livable wage. But, again, it's just not enough. Like, you can't expect people for the guarantee of, you know absolute poverty 15,000 uh, euro a year you can't expect them to give up uh, their their careers so you know we have to follow the standards we have to make the women's game competitive if we're going to have it at all and that's how maybe it will generate money in the future if you're looking at this as some sort of profit making endeavor which i don't think we should be it's still a sporting uh, you know, it, it, it's we're looking at it as a it's a sporting organisation. It's a not for profit. We just need to make sure that we have a team that's able to compete at their level. You know, and it's not going to be possible without professionalism. So I think the idea about them generating money is such a red herring. I don't understand it. No, but it will be talked about. It will, and people will say it in a legitimate way. Well, should, do you get what you're bringing in? But again, that doesn't apply across the board in Irish rugby. The men's yeah, team of is course, the. Yeah. Is the generator. Uh, more from the lads, of course, on the news round tonight from 7 o'clock on News Talk. Now, I'm delighted to say Joey Malone is with us. He's part of the Shelburne coaching ticket that is hurtling towards the end of the Women's National League season and then the Women's Cup final the week after. Uh, exciting times, Joey. Oh, really, really exciting. I mean, I was just, uh, there's a great buzz around with the, the camp with the girls uh, training last night and uh, I think everyone's looking forward to it. It's been a, been a long, hard season. But it's great to be in contention for two trophies and i um, really looking forward to it. So you were league champions last year in fairly dramatic fashion on the last day of the season. Potential for lightning strike twice? Yeah, it's 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 great for us to be in that position now. Um, we, we had a little bit of a slip up after the European uh, European campaign and, and lost a couple of points. But it's great to be going down to Wexford with a, a chance of uh, winning the league. Uh, a draw might do us, but um, certainly a win will. So it just for anybody who's who's um, tuning into this, and there's a good chance you'll pick up a lot of bandwagon fans uh, in the last week, given um, how exciting it is. What are the permutations? Oh, I mean, the, the, the permutations is that we, we've we've looked at the the league uh, as well as maybe about four or five weeks ago, and looked at, at the way that the the point system that was going, and we were kind of thinking that we could be going to Wexford maybe a point ahead if we can win our, our four games, and that's what we've done. Um, now we're looking at like uh, a win on Saturday. We'll definitely win win the league for us. And look, and depending on the result between Bohemians and Athlone, a draw might be enough. So you guys have fifty seven points. Wexford Youths, who you're playing, yep. have fifty six, and Athlone are on fifty five. If you guys draw, if Shells and, and Wexford draw, then yep. and, and Athlone win, yeah, then uh, yourselves and Athlone will be on the same points. Yeah, and and that's going to be a playoff, and I believe um, they've already made a decision that's going to be the Wednesday before the cup final, which will be which will be a lot, you know. But um, at the end of the day, it's it could be Athlone on on the Wednesday and then Athlone on Sunday in the cup final. Right. Okay. So obviously, uh, competition is really intense. P Mount, who you beat on the last day of the season last year, are only four points behind you guys at the top of the table as well. So there's obviously four really good sides in the league who've been duking it out. Yeah, I mean, look, the league had the league has improved so much from last season. There was a there was three or four teams where you'd say, well, that's three points for you. You, know, you can beat them. And but when you look at the improvement that Athlone has made this season, what 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 great strides they've made. Um, obviously, uh, the other teams, the likes of Cox, who who are poor at the start of the season, but really improved. I think the league in general is is improving immensely. And um, obviously, with the the girls qualifying for the the World Cup, it's going to enhance the league even further. And um, does I think the FEI and and the CEO Jonathan Hill and, and Max Gallon, the director of the league, um, should be looking at it now trying to get onto you to uh, UEFA, which we've been asking to deem the league a professional league, which will be which will attract players not only for us, but the other thing is to stop us losing players. We've lost seven internationals from a from a calendar year from July 21 to July 22. We've lost seven full internationals out of our starting eleven. And and I think um, and they've gone for free and we mean between the UEFA and the FIFA and the FIFA compensation. I think that will stop that okay. and obviously help the league to come on. Okay, I didn't realise it. So the designation would actually mean that players wouldn't just be allowed to be cherry picked. They the the picking clubs. They're largely English clubs, I suspect. Are they? Yeah, it's it's the English. I mean, we we've lost. We just recently lost Jess Sue there in July and and uh, and Sasha Noonan as well and, and Chloe Mustaki, who are all internationals to English clubs and and Shelburne got no compensation fee for it. But it was in the boys' side of the game, there'd be compensation. I mean, if you look at Gavin Bazuma, who went for a couple of hundred thousands, and then all of a sudden he's he gets a move to Southampton and and Shamrock Rovers are, are up a million. And I think that type of money that's gone around in the in the men's game. 
um, should be going around in the women's game as well. I mean, the, the English Football League now have, have deemed themselves the best league in the world, the women's football. So, I mean, if they're going to be taking players from the likes of ourselves and, and Piemont and Cork or Galway and like that, there should be some compensation. So, hopefully, I mean, the, the girls qualifying for the World Cup now will, will give the, the FAI a little bit of a push to get all this work done uh, with FIFA and UEFA. That sort of thing probably is crossing your mind when you have a, a, a talent like Abby Larkin in the team as well, who's 17. I mean, I know she scored the two goals against Sligo at the last day out to kind of set up this, this showdown in the final day, but yeah. hard to believe like, she's born in 2005 and yet she has had such an impact on both yourselves and the national team as well. Yeah, I mean, it's like forward to be like a full senior international at, at just turning 17. And uh, we've got like Jesse Stapleton as well, who's been in the international setup. And um, they, they've been, I mean, both of them made their debuts at 16 years of age and, and played a good part in us winning the league last year. And they're also playing a good part this year. And we've got young uh, Leah O'Leary and, um, coming through the international setup as well. As like she's still only 16, made a debut at 15 last year. And so we've got some good young players um, coming through. and you know, when you, when you take the amount of players that we've lost, what, what a fantastic season the girls are having to be able to win the league last year, lose seven of the of, of your, your starting 11 and still be in contention for league and cup double. It's a great achievement for, for, the, for the girls and obviously the, the, the coach and the management team as well. They have to put all this in play. So it's been it's been great season and look, the young girls that are coming through and there's still more young girls coming through are under 17s are in the final on Sunday and... Um, they, they've they've got some decent players coming through, so I think the club's in in a good state at the moment. I know Vera Powell has spoken about you know seeing the likes of Katie McCabe and these girls on on billboards and buses you know in the last year yeah. or two and how the I guess the interest has increased um, dramatically. Uh, have you noticed similar in, in terms of the women's national league? Do you think interest? And I know TG Carr having cameras down in matches, for mm-hmm. example, helps this. But yeah. has the interest and uh, I, I guess the way in which the league is headed. Uh, been to your satisfaction? Like, is is it going in the right direction? Yeah, I think it's going in the in the right direction. And uh, I mean, as I said, obviously the, the international team is is a great influence on on the national league. But we have noticed a difference with the supporters. Even the Shells men supporters are, are a lot of them are coming to the games. I think there's about I think there's five or six buses already booked out to go to Wexford on on Saturday. So there is a, a great interest. And obviously, they, they, I mean, the likes of yourselves and the shows here and 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 the T G Carters and and obviously R T E too showing the, the cup final live as well. It's going to be a big help to the game, but I think the big influence will be the international come next May, next June when I think we might get Ole 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 and all that kind of stuff going on in the pubs right around the country. I think I think the Irish supporters will actually get behind the girls team, and I think that we might get that kind of pub scene again where people will be roaring and shouting at the televisions and the screens and all that. Type. So yeah, it's it does, there's a lot of influences going around at the moment, and I think the the improvement in the national league and the professionalism of the girls. You know, like I mean when you when I mean, I've coached men's teams and, and a lot down through the years, and um, but I think the the, the girls are, are great. They're they they're enthusiastic and and they they put a hell of a lot into it, and they listen to you, and they take everything on board. And and I, and I think it's as I said, the the national league can only get better. It's I think it's got better this year from from the last season, and I think there's going to be more improvement. Like the Bohemians, um, Sean Warren there, and Graham Kelly at uh, DLR. Will certainly be pushing again to try to get into that top three or top four, and obviously you've got the, the Cork Cork influence as well in Galway, and it's good to see that Galway got themselves sorted out as well for next season. What uh, What do you think is the the biggest level of improvement? Where is it coming from? Is it just the the quality of preparation and the the professionalism in the, the backroom teams? Like, because you know the Galway situation was um, was definitely something that kind of raised the, the profile of how difficult it's going to be into the future to make sure that everything washes its face and pays for itself but at the same time once that starts to happen the standard begins to, to rise yeah I, I think it's I mean what you've said the first part was I mean the preparation and the professionalism of that preparation and I also I also believe that you mean you need the likes of the owners like Andrew Doyle at Shelburne and, and the, the CEO David Connor. I mean they've put the resources in place for for us to 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 make it as professional as we can, and I think obviously Damien Duff coming into the men's senior team as manager has helped the club as well. And I mean, what a fantastic season it is for the club to have two two teams in the cup finals. And I think it can that can only get better. We can only get better um, by first of all maybe trying to keep our players a little bit longer, you know, and stop the the players going going to England. Maybe the professionalism needs to come into. The girls even a little bit more where we can have them on at least part time professional contracts, yeah. and to, to stop this the drain of the of the quality players going out of the league. I mean, if you look as I said over the last two seasons now, 
we've lost seven internationals and there's a couple of club, clubs in the league would have lost one or two players for different reasons so I think um, the preparation and the professionalism that is there at the moment can improve and once that improves I think the level the level of the standard of the league will improve and you'll probably have six teams not just two or three yeah, looking for, the, for to be the top of the leagues or going for the trophies. When somebody like Heather O'Reilly um, comes over to play with you guys and there's just kind of relatively global attention, American um, uh, sports media were interested in, okay, that's a bit random, uh, Olympic winner, World Cup winner, World Cup winner. <laughs> coming, to, coming to play, coming out of retirement to play. What was that like? It was it was unreal. You know, like I think the girls were, were amazed by the whole thing and... Uh, when Heather arrived on on the, on the day she did arrive, uh, to, we obviously the, the cameras were out and um, RTE were there and, and TV Three and, and yourselves in at News Talk. Where it was it was kind of high profile stuff to have have such a player such stature coming to play for Shelbourne. Um, certainly certainly improved um, the profile of the club, and and she didn't come just to be just to be like that just for, as a as a. Like something just to, to improve the profile of the club. She came to play and and, and played well, and uh, obviously scored a goal in Europe for us as well. Um, and and players like her coming to the league um, will certainly be a great boost. And we were already talking to her about some players as well that that she could maybe do a job for us. And when she does go back to America, that she could look out for players for us. And um, I think that's the bringing that type of player into into any club is obviously going to raise the profile and and she's fantastic with the girls she's she's uh, she's unbelievable in the dressing room and that training sessions and and uh, certainly the young players that that are there at the moment are looking up to her and I think when she arrived I think everyone just looked up to her it's amazing amazing to have a player like her coming to play for us yeah the long term impact of the on the culture of like the younger players seeing that and and realizing that like uh you you're you're not that far away from players who have been at the very top of the game in terms of your own game and your own ambition. Yeah, I think that's when 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 No King took the job and, and asked me to come along and, and we sat down last year and we, we said, look, we, we you know to bring the, the club where we want to bring it to, we we want to bring the club to, to not only to win in leagues but to to actually doing well in, in European competition. Winning the league last year was probably a little year ahead of schedule, and um, which was great. And so we we got the European adventure and we've learned from it. And, and I think our, our goal now is is to win the league now, have a go at Europe, getting into the, the group stages, which will obviously um, bring more profile to the club, and and bring a little bit more professionalism as well. And and and, and people out there, really the good players around around the world, around Europe or even around the world, will know that I mean Shelburne are a team that would be it'd be worth playing for. So that's that's where we are. That's where we are in our plan. Yeah, for our, it was kind of twenty one to twenty five type of plan. So, and now it's when we when we got it under under um, when we got the European venture last year. It came as I said, it came a little bit early, but that's what that's our plan for the future. Hopefully, that we can put a team out there that will obviously not only do well at home but do well internationally as well. There must be some balls around the club, Joey, when you consider your, your, the women's team success and you've Damien Duff uh, doing good things with the men's team as well. Like, is there much uh, crossover and support between between Duffer's team and and the, the women's team as well? Yeah, it's, there's not a lot because obviously they train most, most of the mornings and we train we, we train three nights a week. Our, our session is Monday, Wednesday and Friday and we play Saturday and, and obviously the, the, the men's team are training their full time. Um, but I, mean, I know Damien is is is, uh, is always, like he's he's tries to get to a couple of our games and I'm sure he'll be at our cup final as well. He was at our cup final last year and I'm sure himself and, and, and the lads would... Um, Given the sending best wishes to the girls and that type of stuff, so um, and obviously we we'll be doing the same for them. They'll be coming to our final. I hope I hope a lot of the lads will come to our final. I'm oh, sorry, they won't be able to because they're playing a match that day, which is a little bit unusual for to have a match on matches on the same day as the women's cup final. But um, but I mean I'm no doubt they'll be sending their best wishes. And Damien is a great influence around the club. Like he's 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 well, like what a player he was, what a fantastic international player he was as well. And it's great to have him at Shelburne and. Yeah, and as I said, fair play to Andrew Doyle and and the, the, the owners and directors and, yeah. and uh, David Connor for bringing them. The um, the atmosphere at, at Talca is carried right across the north side of the city whenever um, the men's team are playing at the moment. There's been kind of an awakening of the club since relegation and since the uh, Save Talca Park move and kind of that was a proper grassroots movement that obviously the, the club needed to reflect and put uh, structures in place. It it feels like that there's a proper community vibe about the club at the moment. Yeah, there's a fantastic community vibe around around the club, and and I think, 
you know, for, for certainly in the last year or two, they've got the academies right, both them, them, the, the men's and the, and the women's and the young kids, and the academies coming through is very professional. Um, they, they, a lot of the younger teams when we were training in the AOL, they they were all up there as well, and and I think the the whole. I think I think the the local community all around has, has has kind of bought into what Shelburne are trying to do and and keeping Tolka Park I think is is a major major thing step for the club and um, hopefully they they'll be able to get the money to uh, improve the ground to, to certain sections of the ground that needs to be improved but um, overall I think the club is in is in good hands at the moment and. Uh, uh, the only way is up, and, and I think the, the, the senior men's team will it will it's a great season for them. They have, they have a mid-table position, and I think they'll they'll get a couple of players in that would could be challenging for trophies next year. So, and, and I think the women's the women's section of the of the game of the club is is very strong. We've got some very good young underage managers as well, and some good coaches come through, and um, and we've got some players in the team that are. Uh, Getting it just over toward you are doing their coaching badges as well, and, and I'm sure they'll be they'll be working with the club for the next few years. Even when they do stop playing, they'll be they'll be taking up coaching roles. When you're talking there, Joey, about uh, Abby Larkin and the young players and trying to nurture them and bring them through, like uh, you, you might tell us a little bit about uh, a <clears throat> good friend of yours, Paul McGrath, and and you know from your own career, was it Charlie Walker? Yeah, uh, Charlie. Charlie. Um, I was captain of, of Pats. We we played in the cup final in 1980, and then uh, we were beaten by Warford, and then. The following pre-season, uh, Charlie made me captain, and he brought this young black lad in into the dressing room, and uh, very short and very quiet. And he said, "He just and he said, he said oh, like, came over to me and said, look, I want you to look after him.' And so, like, I immediately went over and sat talking to him and, and brought him in. And he said, as I said, he was very quiet and shy, and and uh, and he played like we Charlie was played him centre forward at first, and and then played him in centre midfield, and he was just doing okay in in those two positions, and. Um, there was one game we were playing. I think it was we were home to Limerick, and, and you know, you know, at the top of Pathway, you'd go down the steps to the dressing room, the old way into the old dressing rooms. And Charlie called me, and he said, "Look, we said um, the lad McGrath, he's, he's, he hasn't been doing great, and all that." And I, I said, "Charlie, you're playing him in the wrong position. Play him centre half with me. He needs someone talking to him in his ear and that type of stuff." And Charlie said to me, "Well, if he doesn't do it today, he's on his bike." <laughs> that was the club, the club, the board, the directors are not happy, and. But he, he came and played centre half that day with me, and and um, he was immense. He was fantastic, and uh, straight away, he, oh, that it, first game, just I mean, he, a centre forward, he, he didn't do great. That midfield, he didn't do great. But then when he played centre half, like he was a big son. His headers used to go 30, 40 yards up the pitch, and his reading of the game was was fantastic. And then he had me shouting in his ear behind him at the time. So anything he didn't get, I cleaned up at the back and made it made the sweeper's job nice and handy, <laughs> having Paul McGrath in front of you. And he he just went from from that game on. He he just went. He was immense. He was getting player of the months and uh, his tackling. His, his famous tackling was someone getting ahead of him and then just getting around him, the win, winning the ball and. Player would go up in the air and over and off he'd come, and he he, he became like he became an unbelievable player within within a couple of weeks, and like that I, quick, yeah. He kind of got from that stage where Charlie was saying, "Well, if he's not doing it today, he's on his bike." To um, how long can we being, keep him? Being like, all of a sudden he's getting player of the month, and you know, English clubs are interested in him and all that. Time. And I, I said it to Charlie a few weeks later. I said, "We won't have him for long." I said, "Like, there's, there's, there's definitely only English clubs taking him." And he was a Chelsea supporter, but he. Um, Man United were, were were interested in him, and, and I think uh, there was one or two other clubs uh, interested in him as well. And, and obviously, you know, we know he, he went to Manchester United. But he how was, long was he at Pat? I don't. Know. He, he was literally a, a season, um, a season and a bit. I think yeah, a season and a bit, and then all of a sudden it's it's Manchester United, and um, but then like I was on the phone to him all the time, and he was at, over in Manchester, and he told me like they they're not paying me much more than I'm getting uh, between his job here in in Dublin and his job with it uh, and the few bobbies getting all pats. Man, you know, weren't offering him much much more, which seemed a little bit crazy to me. And, and I was because Charlie had gone over, and the chairman had gone over, and I said, well, make sure he's looked after him and get him a good deal. And um, but um, Ron Axon came into. It, to the room and and um, after they had a chat and they talked about the money and all that type of stuff and he said um, he said oh well if you, you want to go back to Pats and he went that was the only word he said to him and he, and he went no 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 so <laughs> he obviously agreed to sign then but look he 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 was always going to be <clears throat> excuse me he was always going to be a top player um, and his his rise his rise to start and what didn't take too long and I mean the, obviously the Manchester United crowd talked to him a big time and. Um, 
and then obviously like the few years at Manchester United he, he had a bit of success and I went to the to the Ford Cup final. He had sent me tickets over, he sent me below went over. And 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 unfortunately other things happened as we all know, like uh, along the way the, the the kind of drinking thing and himself and Norman Whiteside and Alex Ferguson didn't like it and um I don't think he was, I think he knew he wasn't gonna be too long there at, at Manchester once Alex Ferguson took over and um he, he he phoned me one day one night and said that Alex Ferguson wants him to uh, because of all his knee injuries and all that to, to actually go to like maybe pack in the game and, and take out the insurance and all that type of stuff and I said so don't you dare do that you know like you have still a lot of years to go especially with the international team as well and, and um, with that um, Graham Taylor from Master Villa came in from and like, like what, a, what an unbelievable five seasons after like first three or four seasons with Aston Villa like yeah uh, like when when I was in his house, like he, he like the amount of player man of the match trophies that he has around the place from playing for <laughs> Aston Villa, and he obviously got player of the year as well in England. So he and then went on to play such a starting role in the ni- 1990 and 1994 World Cups and for for Ireland. And you know, as I said, in one hand you had Alex Ferguson asking Aston to retire, and then in the second, it's like all of a sudden he's he's winning player of the year in England. He's player the best player for Ireland in the World Cup and. Um, he, he's he's had an unbelievable career despite all the, all the problems he's had along the way. Um, he's had an unbelievable career, and he's you know when when you talk about some of the best players that's ever played for Ireland, he'll certainly be in in that top ten. I'd say, I'd say he's at the top. <laughs> I'd say he's right there at Roy Keane because of what he did yeah. in the World Cups, you know, like and because because of the the problems, the, the knee injuries and all that. Like, um, I. Yeah, he's had, he's had a lot. I mean, he, you know, the, the amount of problems that he's had with his knee, and, and you, you know, at Aston Villa, he, he spent more time in the gym than he did on the pitch because it was always, and they looked after him really well, and like he, he was kind of wrapped in cotton wool type of stuff. That's the way they, they treated him at Aston Villa, and um, there, there was uh, there was a lot of games where where he didn't he didn't feel right with his knee, and you know the physio had done a bit of walking him, and he'd say, I don't know what I can play today, and the, the physio would talk him, and you know you're okay, and he'd get man of the match, yeah. you know that type of stuff. So he he's um, he the, I think the problems with the knees, and 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 obviously is is uh, is early up coming up as a kid in the foster homes and all that, you know there was a, there was a lot for to do what he done coming through. All that kind of foster home situation, that type of stuff, and, um, was, was immense. And it, what, what a great story! And I, I think most people that would have read his book would know that, like, it wasn't always like sunshine and glory. It, there was mm. a lot of hard times along the way, and and for him to to overcome all that and be the player he was, it was, it was fantastic. In terms of the the best players you played against, like I was looking at um, your time with Dundalk, yeah, eighty seven Ajax. Yeah, so with the Cup Winners Cup champions. Like I, was, I was looking at the Ajax team there last night. <laughs> I mean, Van Basten, yeah. uh, Frank Reichard, a 17-year-old Brian Roy, yeah. like 40 odd thousand people there as well. Like, what what was that experience? Oh, like? it was like unbelievable. I mean, it was it was it was it was the one time in, in, in like a day you get as a League of Ireland player to be a full-time player for a week because you're going away early in the week and you're, you're staying in nice hotels and you're training and in the daytime rather than two nights a week and the Saturday morning and playing Sunday. It was like. Uh, it was us being professional week, and then when when we went when we when we drew Ajax, we said, "Yo, and Cruyff to manager, and, and and all the players you're talking about, Frank Rijker, I think Dennis Bergkamp was only a sub, mm. uh, and uh, but we we trained the night before on the pitch, and it was like someone was at the knitting all the grass together. It was it was so tight and so lovely. It was like a carpet, and we because we were we were playing. Sometimes you could play in our season, and you go down to Warford at Kilcona Park, and there'd be muck, <laughs> and you you put your foot in, your your football boot would nearly come off. And so to come to this fantastic manicured pitch was unreal. And then um, we we played obviously the next night, and it was the first time I've seen all you know, these big flags that come down on the top of the heads of people and behind one of the goals. It nearly takes up the whole stand. And yeah. it was like it was amazing to see this coming through. And then. Well, you know, all of a sudden we're, we're, we're playing against these unbelievable international. I mean, they had eight full time international, full Holland internationals in their starting 11, and it was like Roy Card was unreal, and, and uh, Arnold Muren was playing, who had been at Man United. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Roy Card one side, and Muren in the centre, and then you had Naiskins and Van Skip, and like, oh, un- unreal. And uh, the the captain of Holland was, was, was the captain of Ajax as well, and it was like, but it was like, 
they had the ball all the time. We we were just defending. It. I think I had it about three hundred balls out, like diving <laughs> headers and this because uh, they'd come to the end of our box and, and they won't shoot. They'd go out wide and get in and try get because we were tight with the, with, the, with nearly all eleven ten players and Alan O'Neill right in, nearly in the eighty in our box and but we, to be fair to us, we we done really well. I think it was like twenty nil all with twenty three minutes to go and a half time nil all going in. The, the the fans were booing them and right. Yeah, because they were the, the previous uh, European Cup winners cup. They won it that, and they brought the, the trophy out on the pitch before the game and all that. So here we are playing against one of the top teams in Europe and we're nil all at half time and it's now it's tough. What it says, it was great and then obviously the the, the first goal was a an OG hit off the back of Roy Carter to Sean hit off Larry Wise's ankle and spun up. And you couldn't have placed it in the top corner as to where it went to the end. And that was the first goal that broke it. And um, I think Frank Stabling got either the second or the third. Frank Stabling only had time for them that season. They got a second or third. And uh, we ended up losing 4 0. But it was only in the in the last, like, as I said, 20, I think it was 62 or 64, 66, 7th minute when they got what they got the goal, the first goal. So, but it was it was great. It was great to play in a, in a stadium like that against a team like that. And, and obviously they, they bet us two 0 Another OG Paul knew with a twenty yard back pass over <laughs> Alan O'Neill's head in the in the game in Oriel Park. We lost it two 0 But like a great experience. I mean Europe. I mean you can see Sean McCraw was present at the moment. I mean what's what it's done for them and how it's brought the club on. And um, I think I was just reading in, in in the past coming into the car Shelburne back in 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 the, the was it the two thousand and the, the the run they had and the money that I brought into the club. And yeah, the quite, Deportivo. Quite helped, yeah. Know, Dep- Deportivo, yeah, and it was like they were so close, and like European money now is is big, and it helps to develop the League of Ireland clubs big time, and and I think that's where 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 Shelburne now needs to be. They need to be. I mean, that's the next move for Damien now to bring players in that will get them into that U- European stages, and then uh, obviously with ourselves with the women, that's what we want as well. We want to be. I mean, if we'd have qualified for the European stages this year, I think we would have brought half a million mm. just for quali- qualifying for the stages. So yeah. that half a million coming into the women's game would, would be unbelievable and, and would help us get the goal. We, we've, as I said, we've we've a plan to bring us 24 to 25, and I think bring, qualifying for Europe and bringing that type of money into the women's section of the game. Be transformative, say, really. Yeah, big yeah. time. I mean, and you're, you're talking about. I mean, we Noel has got good contacts from his time as manager of uh, the women's senior team and the men's under twenty ones, and he's, he's obviously done the senior men's team for a couple of games. So he's got some contacts around around Europe, where all of a sudden, instead of us losing players, You're that is players draining in. the league of Ireland of good quality players, we could not long if we lose them, we can bring some in, and we can have talks with, with the likes of Man United or Man City or Liverpool or Arsenal, even to players that are on the fringe that could be coming to us. We can't even bring players in on loan from clubs like that because we're not a professional league. Right. So the first thing that the FAI and Mark uh, Scanlon and, and Jonathan Hill needs to do, and we, as I said to you earlier in, in, in the chat, that they need to deem the, the league professional so that we, the, the, the kind, of, kind of plan that we have for Shelbourne can be achieved and, 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 and even further. Are they close to doing that? Are they listening well, they, to you they, when you they, say yeah, that to them? They've been said, they're saying they're talking, they're having the processes is, is in place, but I'm saying, well, why is it taking so long? I mean, for me, it should be just send a letter to... No, we, we've decided be, this, yeah. I think in this day and age, it should be that simple that you you're, you, you kind of fill out a form, send it to UEFA. We want to deem the, the Women's National League a professional league and, and let us get on with it then because we want our teams to be able to achieve... Uh, like high positions in Europe. Not only that, but we also want we also want another competition for the women's football. I mean, the men's have three competitions. They've got the, the European, the Champions League, the, the Conference the League, UEFA and the League, League, and, and the Conference yeah. League as well. So, and the, the women only have one. So, I mean, whoever finishes runners up in our league should be going into a European competition. Whoever wins our FAI Cup should be going into a, a European competition. And that's where the, the FAI need, need to be. They need to be having those conversations so that we can bring this league on. I mean, those those. Uh, Story I read in, in one of the UA or the FAI, it was a UA for conference, and a, a past player in England, probably a well known player, I can't remember her name at the moment, but she said the, the only reason why they, have, they are hosting the European and winning the European uh, Nations League at women's level was because they deemed it the league professional. Up to that, you had girls getting a bus, to, you know, and, and getting a bus to, to train them. 
paying, paying fees and paying subs at, at Arsenal and Man City and yeah. clubs like that. She said, now, since we, we made the league, professional league, we are now the best league in the world. And we, I'm not saying that the, the National League in Ireland is going to be one of the best leagues well, in the world. It, it, it but but we can that. certainly come along and, and keep our players here, keep our best players here, which will help the international team. And, and also bring players in from, from abroad to help us achieve our goal, which is to qualify for the European stages the, of the, the league stages of the Champions League. Yeah. You're a bit of a legend in, in Monaghan, Joey, as well. I know uh, in my, that's my home club, Monaghan. Oh, yeah. But uh, the Billy Baxter line <laughs> yeah, is still up Billy there. Yeah, Billy Baxter days. Yeah. And they, uh, what happened, I was actually at the start of the season. It was a mad, mad season. I left Galway uh, as a player manager. I, I, I um, went to Longford. And then uh, Warford asked me, to, Alfie Hale asked me, would I go to Warford halfway through the season? Well, about a way through the season, and I went to Warford. And then they ran into financial difficulties with it. So, with about two months ago, um, it was it was in the papers that I had to leave Warford because they couldn't afford to to uh, with the finance and stuff. So Billy Baxter rang me, and I went to Monaghan, and we ended up uh, qualifying or getting promoted to the to the Premier Division that that year. And, um, and that season was the, the fourth season. They tried the six and six. Do you remember that? Can they, where yeah, they yeah. The, probably, yeah. You probably don't remember. It was like uh, they they split the league. Like the SPL. Monaghan was Monaghan was great. It was it was great. It was um, unbelievable volunteer workers. You know, I mean, it's it's great to, when you go to clubs like that. The amount of volunteer workers that that give their time and all it was fantastic. But it's a pity Monaghan didn't didn't stay in the league because um, they were they were, really, they were a good club to play for. Joey, great stuff. We could listen to you all day. Thanks a million. That <laughs> yeah, was brilliant. That's football, isn't very, it? Very wide ranging. All day. But um, I think that that passionate call for the FAI to make the league professional is something we'll definitely follow up on so best of luck this week and then in the cup final as well whatever yeah, happens yeah I really appreciate it. if you keep that up it'll be great you know that's um, it's uh, it's it's something that I think will, will certainly be worthwhile for the league definitely it's an yeah. important story as well OTBM brought to you live with Gillette in association with Movember effortless shave magnificent mo. you can sign up or donate now at movember.com after the break sports writer Paddy Agnew will tell us why you had to be there stay tuned there are universal values that should define football Values such as respect, dignity, trust, and courage. When we represent our nation, we aspire to embody these values. As PFA members, we understand the power of collective bargaining and the fundamental rights of all workers to form and join a union. Before players had won these rights, their careers in Australia were characterised by the absence of respect and dignity. It is for these reasons we must speak about the situation in Qatar. Over the last two years, we have been on a journey to understand and learn more about the situation in Qatar. We are not experts, but we have listened to groups such as Amnesty, FIFA, the Supreme Committee, the International Labour Organization, FIFA Pro, and most importantly, the migrant workers of Qatar. We have learned that progress has been made both on paper and in practice. The kafala system has largely been dismantled, working conditions have improved, and a minimum wage has been established. Whilst the reforms established in Qatar are an important and welcome step, their implementation remains inconsistent and requires improvement. We have learned that the decision to host the World Cup in Qatar has resulted in the suffering and in the harm of countless of our fellow workers. These migrant workers who have suffered are not just numbers. Like the migrants that have shaped our country and our football, they possess the same courage and determination to build a better life. As players, we fully support the rights of the LGBTI plus people. But in Qatar, people are not free to love the person that they choose. Addressing these issues is not easy, and we do not have all the answers. We stand with Faith Pro, the Building and Woodworkers International, and the International Trade Union Confederation, seeking to embed reforms and an establish a lasting legacy in Qatar. This must include establishing a migrant resource center, effective remedy for those who have been denied their rights, and the decriminalization of all same-sex relationships. These are the basic rights that should be afforded to all and will ensure continued progress in Qatar. This is how we can ensure a legacy that goes well beyond the final whistle of the 2022 FIFA World Cup. One that football can truly be proud of. One that football can truly be proud of. One that football can be truly proud of. One that football can truly be proud of. One that football can truly be proud of. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? You know, no Aston Villa manager has ever left Aston Villa and went on to anything. Aren't they even up to Ireland, man? 
Sideways. Sideways. I forgot about that. Let's not have a, have a go at ourselves here. Yeah, Mick, is it? You, Aston Villa fans, have no I chance. went through all the managers and I forgot about O'Neill going to Ireland. Well, he got to the Euros, so. Yeah, it's a step up. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. The Irish Centre for Diversity is proud to launch the inaugural National Diversity and Inclusion Awards. Taking place in Croke Park on Thursday, February 2nd, the NDI Awards celebrate individuals and organisations that go above and beyond in their commitment to diversity and inclusion. Free entries close this Friday and nominations are open across 10 categories, including race and ethnicity, gender, LGBTQ+, and disability. Visit ndiawards.ie for more. And remember, closing date for entries is this Friday. OTB AM with Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mode. It's so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moments. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. I had to be there. Right, I'm very excited about this. Paddy Agnew joins us for this week's episode of You Had to Be There. Paddy, how are you? Good morning, Jeff. I'm sorry, we're, we're a bit late here. We got carried away there with the stories of um, Paul McGrath's first defensive centre-back partnership, which um, is a little slice of history. You have many slices of history in your five selections here. And uh, I'm very, very jealous, particularly the early ones here. Your first yeah. one is Diego Maradona in Naples yeah. in April yeah. in 1987, a game against Fiorentino. Tell us about this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I picked all, all these things, Jer, uh, obviously, because they were all... Uh, they weren't just good games. They were games that, uh, in some shape, marked a, a historic moment in, uh, in in football. And for me, also, there, you know, uh, I think we all tend to feel the things that we saw when we were young uh, were always better than anything you see today. Uh, so they have huge significance for me because I spent a lot of those early uh, years. Uh, following uh, Diego uh, Armando Maradona and down in Naples. Now, now that day, the day of, uh, we're talking about May 1987, uh, I remember um, as we uh, pu- pulled into the train station in, in uh, Naples, I was uh, sitting in a carriage with a couple of American tourists and they looked out the window and they said, oh, goodness, what's happening? You know, uh, because the entire Naples was... Um, decorated in blue uh, flags and uh, we had uh, big posters all over the place saying we are the champions i mean they weren't actually the champions yet but they were taking it for granted they were going to win uh and you know the the atmosphere i think it's only fair to say that not since the american troops arrived at the end of the second world war in 1945 had you seen uh a more uh, significant day in uh, Neapolitan history because uh, they were uh, about to win their first ever title uh, and it was a sort of coming of age and uh, uh, for uh, an always underprivileged South and particularly uh, uh, a city like Naples never come close to uh, winning a a title. When when did you move to, to Italy, Paddy? No, I moved to Italy in uh, 1986, December 85, January 1986. Uh, and, you know, Maradona was already there and he was already doing extraordinary things. And it was very, very quickly became, you know, the biggest story, that, uh, uh, by far the biggest football story that I covered uh, in those years. Am I right in saying that your main beat was actually like the Vatican and Italian politics, but the football was kind of a sideline that you managed to turn into a much more important part of your role? No, it wasn't. I mean, I was um, not quite right because I, I had been the sports editor of the Sunday Tribune in Dublin. I'd written about sport for McGill uh, and uh, I'd started off as a sports journalist. Um, but, you know, since I, when, you're, when you're living as a freelance in a place like Italy, uh, you're going to sell what stories you can sell. And um, uh, I'd chosen to come here because I thought, well, there'd be a lot of interest in Italian football. But I had also thought, yeah, there could be a bit of interest in, in the Vatican. 
And yeah, I, as as the years gone by, um, I've uh, done an awful lot of politics and news stories and Vatican stories. You caught the. Uh, it was a good time to move to to, to Naples, Paddy, and and uh, to Italy. But uh, like, and you, anyone who's seen the films on on Maradona, like, will know that he. he I mean, he, he was revered anyway before the '86 World Cup, but. What, yeah. How did it change then after the World Cup in '86? Was it was it almost? It's almost godlike after that, and I'm sure the the, well, the reception around Maradona, Maradona changed before and after that World Cup. Well, well Shane, it, it was godlike. And let, let me just tell you this: one of the things that uh, you know, in in the build up to that uh, uh, that that game against Fiorentina, the day they won the first title, uh, there was a, a, a prayer that appeared on uh, in shops all around uh, uh, Naples, and it said. Uh, it basically, I mean, it's, it's blasphemous, but I mean, I apologise to anybody who get offended by it, but he said, our, our Maradona who takes the field, uh, we have hallowed thy name. Thy kingdom is Napoli. Lead us not into disappointment, but deliver unto us the title. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I mean, he, he was... Uh, yeah, he was a, a godlike figure to uh, I think, a but, lot of the, Ita- the Neapolitan fan. Pope John Paul II was the Pope at that point, wasn't he? So he was—he was a football man. I think he—he he was a goalkeeper when he was younger. So he—he, he, I don't think he would have called a blasphemous. I think he would have understood Paddy potentially. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I hope I hope so. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, the great thing about this era is that it's not just defined by Maradona, even though he was the preeminent footballer in the world and the best footballer in the world, because at the same time, Silvio Berlusconi decides to turn AC Milan into the greatest football team in the world. And he's looking at the great young uh, Dutch footballers who are coming through. We talked a little bit about um, Joey Malone playing against Marco van Basten for Ajax, he signs for AC Milan at the same time. Basically, the Italian league is the best league, most important football league in the world at this point, and all of the best players are gravitating towards two or three teams at those um, at, at that time. Absolutely, you had uh, you had above all you had uh, Maradona, you had Platini at Juventus, you had the Dutch lads uh, Van Basten and Hull going to uh, AC Milan. You had Zico, uh, Zico played for Udinese, believe it or not. So I mean, you had. You had in those days it was the Hollywood of football, and it was you know it was what the Premiership is today. You know, uh, everybody wanted to play there, but uh, that um, uh, goes through. We've got two games here, two Napoli games. That April '87, the day they won the title, they beat Fiorentina, uh, and uh, you know it wasn't I, 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 the excitement around the game was incredible. I don't remember the game as being a great game, uh, but. Um, you know, Napoli scored a, the Carnival scored a goal early on for Napoli uh, and then a 20 year old who I'd never seen before who most of us hadn't seen before called Roberto Baggio stepped up for Fiorentina and he scored a brilliant free kick goal and you thought to yourself, Jesus, that can play a bit Yeah. Uh, and and uh, that was his first ever Serie A goal, it was a <laughs> great day to score your first ever Serie A goal um, but after, after but the, sec, the second half of the game, so it was one one and a half time. The second half of that game uh, was basically uh, um, Fiorentina didn't it meant nothing to Fiorentina at that point whether they basically won, lost, or drew because they were in mid table, and um, basically both sides uh, laid down their swords in the second half, and they we waited we wait, waited for the game to get to an end for the. Uh, the whole stadium to go absolutely mad, and the person who went mad as was Maradona because he um, he didn't come off the pitch for a long time. And I remember w- watching him, you know, very very closely. He walked to he walked right around the pitch and he stopped about four or five times uh, in different points and stood there with his chest stuck out, arms wide open, blowing kisses uh, to the, the Napoli fans, uh, and you know. Uh, after the game, I remember he, he said, well, you know, this is different. This is better than the World Cup I won in Mexico last year because uh, that was in Mexico. Uh, here, you know, I'm uh, all my family's here. Uh, the city of Naples are with me because I consider myself a son of Naples. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was, that was absolutely true. I mean, he was a son of Napoli. There's no question of that. 
the, then, 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 then a year later, Jerry, we had we had Napoli again in the the centre of a, maybe a passing on the baton because that AC Milan side that was uh, uh, the had been bought over in 1986 um, by the media tycoon Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, there, that investment was being realised. And they came down to uh, they came down to Napoli. They needed to. Uh, w- Napoli were still leading the uh, lead on the day they met, but it was like well, I think the third last day of the season. Uh, but um, you know they were a very very good team. Um, Virdas got a goal for them very early on, and then Maradona scored a fantastic free kick to make it one one. Uh, and then we got into the second half, and we had two sort of. Similar moments. Uh, uh, it twice uh, picked up balls just inside his own half and made it, made one of those great runs of his. Uh, the first time he, he set it up for Rodriguez to make it two uh, one, and then the second time he set it up for Van Basten. And the interesting thing about that was that Van Basten at that point was relatively unknown, and it, even in Italy, even though we've been here for the whole season. Because he had um, injury problems, uh, and so it, it was a, like a, a amazing moment for him to come on and score the goal in a game like that. Um, and, and, and a small thing I remember after the game, we're talking about 1988 now, and uh, there were no mobile phones, and there were uh, there, there was no satellite TV. It was a different world, and I was in the press room and all the little phone booths filing my copy, and. Who was in the booth beside me? Uh, but Adriano Galliani, the uh, managing director of Milan, a longtime friend and, and, and uh, ally of Silvio Berlusconi. And I heard Galliani, <laughs> I was delighted to hear this. I heard Galliani saying, Ah, uh, can I speak to Dr. Berlusconi? And um, you know, there's a bit of a pause. And then he says, Silvio, è andato bene, molto, molto bene. <laughs> Wow, no, it, it 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 went well, Silvio. <laughs> Which it certainly had done. It had gone very well. <laughs> so even Silvio Berlusconi, owner of like satellite TV companies, couldn't get a a, a dodgy feed no. of the game. Uh, no, in those days, in those days, wow. uh, th- there was no there was no live coverage. Wow, that's um like, and this is obviously just months before uh, Van Basten announces himself as the best centre forward in the world at the Euros yeah. by like, yeah. you know, absolutely sensational goal in the final that we all remember. Yeah. Um, if, yeah. memory, if memory serves, it's Arnold Muren who crosses that over. Who, That's who, correct. Yeah. Who Joe, Joe Malone was talking wing. about. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it, It's a fantastic goal. One it's almost like goals. we planned this show today for, <laughs> for these bits all to follow. Um, that rivalry between those two clubs is quite explosive. There's also a memory in my mind of like... Uh, at least two of the three Dutch players getting sent off and taking their tops off and throwing them into the crowd. Is that like the 1990 season where there's kind of, where yeah. Naples, the, the, yeah. the Napoli team drew fire from AC Milan and drove them on to the greatness that we then saw at, at European level? Yeah, 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 yeah. But there's also the 1990 season it was controversial because uh, Napoli uh, picked up a point for having one of their players, uh, they they lost a game. I think it was at, against Atalanta, and they picked up then a point because uh, the football federation intervened and, and, and gave them uh, uh, a point for uh, the fact that one of their players, De Napoli, it was Fernando De Napoli, been hit by a coin thrown by a fan, and so they changed the result of the match, and at that point obviously made the difference. Yeah. Uh, and the Milan fans always said it was, you know, Napoli hadn't deserved to win the title that year. Um, I can see why that would uh, lead to certain uh, bad <laughs> Certainly words. did, yeah. Um, yeah and curiously enough, Jeff, it's worth worth pointing out that uh, that rivalry is still very strong. The two strongest sides in uh, Italy at the moment are, are, are Napoli and, and they see Milan. And, you know, both have done very well in the Champions League again this week. Napoli are sensational to watch at the moment. Like Napoli the, are sensational. Yeah, one of the most exciting teams in world football at the moment. Uh, let's move on to that night in Turin where I think Roy Keane's yeah. legacy in world football terms is sealed. Like we obviously, from an Ireland perspective, think of the World Cup qualifying campaign, his games against yeah. Portugal and Holland in particular. But for Manchester United yeah. fans, this is the, the high watermark. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, and can I tell you something again on a personal note? I had, you know, I've been here since 86. I'd never seen Roy Keane play. Uh, it was the first time, one of the few times actually, was at the at the stadium uh, to see him play. But, you know, that was a strange, a remarkable game because few teams come to uh, Turin, uh, go ten, go two goals down after 10 minutes and live to tell the tale. But there was a funny thing about that game because even when they were 2 nil down, you had the suspicion, uh, you had the feeling that they weren't out of it. Um, and, you know, sure enough, they, they had, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they played some very, very good football. Uh, and, you know, uh, by halftime, it was 2-2. Uh, it was York, York and uh, who was score? I who scored the other one. Cole, I think. Cole, yeah. Andy Cole. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I mean, um, it, the, the man who's, who put, put them back in the game was Keane. It was his, he, he scored the first goal. That's right, yeah. A, a header from a corner. Uh, and Keane was involved in everything uh, United were doing. I mean, he was uh, he, he absolutely in control of the midfield. He was absolutely, um, uh, he was very good in defence. Uh, I mean, he was a terrific player, I don't have to tell you that. But uh, what, what uh, I remember was that from the moment he scored that headed goal, you had the feeling that Juventus were worried about him. <laughs> and uh, they, they they weren't uh, they weren't comfortable, so there was a sort of inevitability about it. Uh, uh, when um, you know they they uh, got uh, got their winner uh, in, in the second half. Um, Clive Tilsley. But, but what the point the point about two two of course as I remember was that the, the away goals rule meant that they were already in the final mm. at two two uh, United. The, the, so, like the, Paddy, the commentary, I guess, from Clive Tilsey is famous for a lot of people who are watching on TV. Um, but then Roy Keane with the captain's goal for Manchester United and I think it was full speed ahead Barcelona when Cole scored the the last one. Um, but w- like w- his dominance was obviously apparent if you're there on the night. Like, what, what was the atmosphere like? There was a, a decent travelling United support, judging by the, the videos watching it back. But, and there was, there was. No, it was a great, it was a great atmosphere. No question of that. Uh, and, you know, the United... Uh, uh, silence the uh, Turin fans, the Juventus fans, to a certain extent. I, I remember one thing I remember about afterwards was that um, uh, when the players came out, um, we got to talk to Roy Keane, and I remember, uh, you know, he. You remember he got a, a second yellow card and he had to miss the final against Bayern Munich, and um, you know anybody in that situation, you could. Uh, you would have, wouldn't have been surprised if they'd said some unpleasant things about the referee or they had expressed their huge disappointment they're not being at a final, for God's sake. I mean, it would sicken you. But um, King was very self-controlled. Um, he was very, and he was very fair. And he said, you know, the, the, I remember him saying, ah, the great thing is, okay, you know, uh, um, I, knew, I knew this could happen coming here. Um, I've said it before, I'm not going to tip... Th- Tiptoe through matches, <laughs> which was a, a great version of Roy Keane. He's never tipped through, <laughs> tiptoed through any match in his life or anything. Uh, <laughs> but you know, he said, um, "I remember. So I knew, I knew before the game that a booking could rule me out. Uh, but I can't tell anything about that now. And it doesn't matter. I'm delighted that were the the clubs in the, the final in uh, Barcelona against Munich." Can I just point out as well to everybody the the midfield that he was up against was uh, Captain Antonio Conte, that Antonio Conte, yeah. Uh, yeah. Didier Deschamps, Edgar Davids, Angelo Delivio, and Zidane dropping in to pick up balls deep. Yeah, uh, behind yeah. behind Pippo and Zaghi. So it's like decent look. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it was a fantastic Juventus team. It was a good team. Uh, so you had to be you had to be on your a, a game to uh, defeat them. I think one of the things that. Um, uh, I think the pace of that Man United side sort of caught a, a number of the your European rivals off guard that season. You know, they played with a lot of pace. They knocked it around very fast, and yeah, uh, 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 and um, you know, uh, York in particular front gave Juventus a lot of problems that night. Yeah, Keane's athleticism was explosive in a way that maybe. Uh, people don't really notice because he gets the ball from the centre back, he passes it to the right back, he gets it back and he passes it again. But it was explosive in over 10, 15 yards, which gave him 
when he was running on, when he was running past a centre midfielder or past a defender, all of a sudden, like, hang on, how did he get there? So, uh, Paddy, I've got to move on. Your last two selections are both international football. The first yeah. one is June 2000 at the Euros, and it's France versus Spain. Uh, I don't remember this too much. What, what was the story here? <laughs> well, no, I, the, one of the reasons I stuck this one in is because uh, I was thinking a lot of people wouldn't have seen it, but I was lucky to be at the game. It was an absolutely fantastic game. France uh, beat Spain 2-1. It was one of those games in which you just couldn't believe the quality of the football you were watching. Um, you know, in particular, uh, Zidane again for, you know, it was the, uh, the great French side of the day. Uh, and, uh, you know, Zidane opened the, opened the uh, uh, festivities with a fantastic free kick goal. Um, Mendieta then got a penalty for uh, Spain. It was, uh, and then Jorkov got a fantastic goal just before half time. Jorkov, um, who was playing for Inter at the time. And uh, throughout then the second half, it, 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 it remained that way until we were actually in injury time when Spain got a penalty and they could have uh, taken the game into uh, uh, extra time. Uh, Raul took the penalty and he blasted high over the bar and uh, France had gone through. But uh, the reason I picked that game was um, the drama the drama of, 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 of that missing that penalty at the end, the excitement of it, but just the quality of the game. And I remember talking to Mark Lawrence and afterwards, um, and uh, I said to Mark, uh, God, Mark, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know much about football, but that looked to me like an absolutely fantastic game. And he said, oh, God, that was a tasty one. That was a very, very good game. Uh, I mean, it, 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 there was a lot of quality there. But, you know, if you look at the... Uh, uh, the um, the film of the game now. Uh, one one thing. <laughs> well, I'm sure will make Manchester City fans uh, amused. As you see uh, a, a certain Guardioli playing and playing really well in that game. But at a certain point in the second half, he whacks down Jorkov and gets himself a yellow card because Jorkov was in very good form and he had to be taken down. So, uh, old Pep Guardiola, the great uh, lover of the the beautiful game. He was also capable of knocking a man down if he had to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do whatever it takes. That's, of course, the same Spain team who knock us out of the World Cup two years later. So I'd say people yeah, will yeah. be pretty familiar with it. That's quarterfinal stage of, of uh, Euro 2000. And that's that France team kind of expressing themselves, having unburdened the whole country by winning the World Cup in 98. And then um, they go on. That's the golden goal final, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I was at that too, obviously. And... I definitely remember thinking that night that this golden goal is not a good thing, you know, because that that game, uh, Italy had a won and should have uh, held on to win. And very un typically for an Italian side, they they conceded a late equaliser to France, and from that moment on, you thought that Spain were or that uh, France would win. But um, your last I, one, I remember, I remember the sick the sickening feeling we got on that. Uh, uh, the winning goal went in. Not, I mean, not just the Italians got the sickening feeling, but there's a feeling of it's not. It doesn't seem right that the yeah, match yeah. is not over just because that goal has gone in. You know. Yeah, it was the the uh, the virus of Americanization had infected football. Yeah. And we're like, oh, we have to do this. That's what they do in American football, and everything's great there. It's like, well, yeah, yeah. no, no, yeah, yeah. it's not. Uh, th- this last one, um, I think I've only met you in person once, Paddy, and it was the summer of 2006. Um, I was touring around Germany for the World Cup. And it was kind of yeah. the end of the group stages and we met you and you were like, I think this Italian team, there's something about them. I was like, no, you, you've just been living there too long. You've got um, Stockholm Syndrome. And you were 100% correct. There was something brewing from that Italian team over the course of the tournament. And I think it finds full expression in your final selection here, which is the World Cup semi-final against Germany. Yeah, yeah no, it's a great game. But let, let me tell you one thing, Ger, about my prediction. I, I wrote a book that year, Forza Italia about Italian football and it came out just before the World Cup and in my last uh, in the original version of it my last chapter I imagined the World Cup final and I had France playing I had uh, France playing Italy in that World Cup final in my book right, right. and my editor said to me oh, you're in Egypt you can't do that your France and Italy won't get to the final for God's sake you can't we'll look stupid and I, I thought about it and thought well it's probably right of course they won't get the final but um, I did think Italy would do quite well. Uh, <laughs> however, he took it out when I wrote uh, uh, a less uh, uh, outrageous uh, uh, final. But th- that night, though, at the uh, 
uh, Westfalen Stadium in uh, Dortmund, you know, was um, I don't know, I don't know how many of our listeners have been to the Westfalen Stadium, but it's one of the great uh, stadia of European football and uh, German football. It's a, a tremendously big stadium, tremendous atmosphere, uh, and watching Germany playing a World Cup semi-final there, it, you know, Italy were up against it. It was a serious battle, um, and it was very very tough. Uh, and that team, uh, that Italian team, surprise, surprise, um, you know, uh, were, uh, they got through it with their determination and, and above all their defensive uh, quality. And if you want to pick out an outstanding player that night, I'd pick out uh, Cannavaro, uh, their captain, their central defender. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I'd forgotten about I mean, uh, uh, that game was I looked at the highlights of the match last night and I'd forgotten that. Both the goals in that game uh, came uh, in the last two minutes of extra time. Yeah, it's, it's Grosso. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, we were we were all getting ready for the penalty, weren't we? <laughs> and Grosso's, it's probably one of the, the best celebration you'll ever see in person, Paddy, as well. At the famous uh, run down the sideline with the hands outstretched, the most Italian of celebrations, and he's in tears <laughs> as well. It was unbelievable. It was fantastic. But you know, right? I, 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 there's another thing, reason why I. Um, I love that because they, that, that match, um, the uh, second goal, the goal in the 120th minute was Del Piero. And that came from a, a, a German corner. Canavara burst out of the area and knocked it forward. Uh, Totti picked it up. He knocks it wide to Giardino. And Giardino then plays a really clever sort of no-look uh, pass to uh, Del Piero who curls it beautifully past uh, Lehman, I think was a goalkeeper, uh, for the second goal. And um, what I remember about that was, I don't know if you remember, but you know, the, the disappointment of Euro 2000 when uh, France had beaten um, Italy, uh, one of the disappointments of that game was that Del Piero in the second half of that match had the chance to wrap it up for Italy uh, and he'd missed it. And he got slagged and criticised, and people were always reminding him how he didn't win the European Championship for us in 2000, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he laid that ghost that, that night in Dortmund because he sealed up the World Cup for them. Yeah, and uh, what, a, what a final that was with um, Zidane and the headbutt as well. My recollection of the night specifically wasn't, you, you picked a defender and a, um, a forward. The two midfielders that uh, Andrea Pirlo and Gennaro Gattuso oh, yeah. I, just, I think it's the greatest game Gattuso's ever played he was sensational but Pirlo there was just this mag- magnetism that they were able to control the ball and take the sting out of the Germans and the German crowd who kind of were not fully behind the team at the start of the tournament and then all of a sudden had yeah. kind of erupted they got, and, they got behind them yeah yeah yeah, and, um, and they didn't expect to go that far and here all of a sudden they were on the brink and it was like oh yeah. typical Germans but yeah, yeah. the the whole thing was just taken out of them by the two geniuses in midfield as well. So um, that that's also on my list of uh, you had to be there. It's um, all time great. Well, sporting. absolutely, absolutely. Pier- Piero. I mean, I'm glad they mentioned Piero because he was like uh, you know, the great genius of that Marcello Lippi side. He was a wonderful player, uh, and and uh, you know he, he did. Uh, do you remember his uh, penalty against England in the <laughs> European Championships? <laughs> Two years later, you know. <laughs> Paddy, we're unfortunately out of time, but that was an absolutely brilliant episode of You Had to Be There. Thanks so much for sharing those with us. You're most welcome. Just so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moments. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. I had to be there. Stick that stadium on your bucket list. Really? Yeah. So it, at the international games, they closed the terrace, so it's actually smaller capacity, but right. the atmosphere was still unbelievable. Jeez. Like it was, it was the, the best final stadium. Yeah, that was the that was the best. What city is that? That's Munich, Dortmund. Is Dortmund. Sorry, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, of course. That I've, I've ever been in uh, or at. Um, right. OTBAM brought to you by Gillette in association with Movember. Effortless shave, magnificent mo. You can sign up or donate now at Movember.com. We're back tomorrow morning with Adrian and Johnny in the studio. First ever Talton Cup Player of the Year. Westmead's Ronan O'Toole will be in studio. David Snade will reflect on Shamrock Rovers season. Obviously tonight against Ghent is the uh, final home European game. We'll hear from the managers of Wexford Hughes and Athlone Town heading into the huge weekend of the National League. Uh, we spoke about earlier on with Joey Malone. Ronan Mullen will preview Katie Taylor's Saturday night fight against Karen Carabayal. Plus more besides. In the meantime, we're going to leave you with some Ian McKinley, uh, his chat about his new book alongside Joe Malloy last night. Enjoy. 
Very happy to say Mr. Ian McKinley is in studio, played for Leinster, Zebra, Benetton, Italian International, a new book written with Jerry Thornley, Second Sight, Rugby and Redemption. You're very welcome. Joe, good to see you always again. always a pleasure. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's always a big undertaking and, and Jerry Thornley, I know, uh, great to get him involved. Why was this something that you really wanted to commit to paper and write about? Because you've always struck me as relatively private-ish and, and uh, low-key in many ways and you're opening yourself up a touch here. Yeah, it's a, certainly a strange experience, very therapeutic, if I'm to be honest. Um, now, it has taken a while to put everything uh, down on paper, but I think it's just important to share the story because it is quite a unique one. Uh, and I just ultimately hope that people take something from the story and show that if you do have a setback in life and mine just happened to be along the rugby path that you, you know, that you can achieve what you want to achieve and you need a little bit of luck and help along the way, but uh, things can be achieved. So again, like I hope people take something from it. When you say therapeutic, just hit me when you said that. Did you ever go to therapy about this ordeal and this trauma? Funny people have been asking me like whenever it happened, you know, because mental health is such a buzzword at the moment and or, you know, a couple, you know, uh, such a buzz thing at the moment. Yeah. No, never. Like, it was never a, a thing. Do you need to speak with someone when it happened? It was just, I was very much of the opinion of, like, just keep working and get throw yourself into as many things as possible so that you didn't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, but no, since since <laughs> the book has come out, everyone has started to ask me about that. Yeah. But no, never, never have. I guess it was 2010, which is not a lifetime ago. But I think, as you said, the conversation around mental health has even accelerated massively in the last decade. Perhaps if it had happened today, you might have been told, well, you should go and speak to someone, but who knows what the right answer is. Yeah, potentially, and who knows if, if it would have helped or, or not. But I suppose as experience has gone on, probably the way I dealt with it was, I mean, there's different ways you could have gone about it. Probably was not a very effective way, but I think ultimately you know it was a traumatic thing even yeah. though i do know it is not the worst thing that can happen but to me at the time uh you know having your eyeball burst and then ultimately losing your sight uh, through a rugby in injury yeah. like that's uh, your sort of dreams are dashed and everything like that so it was it was definitely seen as a death in our family ultimately oh, yeah. yeah absolutely we'll get into the story in a moment but i suppose as I, i'm sure you've been thinking about it over the last couple of days as you've seen the book uh, thrown out into the public and you've, you've talked about it with various people what effect do you think the whole mad awful ordeal the last 12 years what effect do you think it's had on you as a person how do you think it's shaped you yeah, it's a pretty good question Joe you've gone in pretty heavy on that on that one well you were it, only 20 when it happened so yeah, you know um, well certainly there's negative and positive things so the negative things would be you know driving is difficult particularly in Ireland here on the different side of the road. In Italy, it was actually easier because you had, it was just easier being on the other side of the road there, uh, being in busy places. So airports, uh, shopping centres would bump into people quite a lot. And yeah, your skill set is put under huge uh, amount of pressure in terms of uh, your depth perception, being left footed, kicking off your left foot, sometimes not seeing the ball, mm. goggles being an issue and all that sort of stuff positive side of that was got to experience a different culture of rugby um, which was fantastic also difficult um, but you just got to experience the different side of of, uh, of life and rugby in that sense and then been having got involved in different projects um, I think as a professional rugby player you know you're very privileged to be in that position but you were in a, you're in a very small percentage in the global mm. rugby uh, market as it were and now to um, been able to experience visually impaired rugby, mixed ability rugby, the other side of side of it uh, has been very fulfilling. Now, whether that would have happened be, because of the injury, I don't know. But uh, so I'd say that there's positives and negatives, definitely. Mm. It's interesting when I ask you there, what effect do you think it's had on you uh, on a pers as, as a person? You went for that, the superficial stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas what I'm wondering is, yeah. this had the potential to make you angry, bitter, resentful, um, maybe a, a more complete person? A more spiritual person on 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 that maybe mm. deep deeper level. Do you think it's had any uh, profound effect on you, or would you be a pretty similar person? Um, no, it it of course it has. Yeah. Um, I think if I wasn't able to uh, experience the six years with the goggles uh, through you know the lower ends of Italian rugby up till uh, international, if I didn't experience that, the mm. highs and lows of what 
it was to be a true professional, even though I was training as a professional growing up through Leinster and Irish under 20s and all that. But to try and create your own path, if I didn't have that, I'd be immensely bitter. And I was bitter, um, probably not a very nice person to be around in terms of short, snappy responses um, when I retired. Mm. Um, and, you know, probably my family, friends, my girlfriend, my wife probably bear the brunt of that. Uh, and that's not the type of person that you want to you want to be and you don't want people to be around you uh, in, in, in that scenario. So uh, thankfully that didn't happen yeah. uh, because I, I could see it as a snowball effect and that's probably why I ended up having a, a breakdown with my brother because it was just all this build-up of, of emotion and for that I can never sort of uh, repay him and my family yeah. uh, but ultimately I think it shaped me in a, in a good way because you, you experience different things how, how could it not yes you know? yeah the book jumps right in let's not dance around the book like let's let's, mm -hmm. let's address what happens and it does that straight away so January 2010 you had just turned 20 the previous December so you're, you're, you're still a kid really and it's UCD against Lansdowne and even the way you describe it it's so um sudden you know i guess that's the the mad thing about so many life-changing moments car accidents something like this it's just so sudden and unexpected and you just say uh, on the ground something catches your face and boom left eye everything's black and then there is the sentence as you referenced a moment ago standalone sentence my eyeball has just burst so that's a shocking moment there's a trip to vincent's where your brother philip is told ian's just lost his eye mm -hmm. And he tries to stay calm in amidst that awfulness. And so it's, well, we need to get over to the Eye and Ear Hospital. And on that drive, you decide to have a look at it in the car. I can't say I would have. I understand the grim curiosity, but you said, um, I need to have a look at this, much to the horror of Philip and anyone there saying, mm. please don't look at it. Is that memory fairly etched on the brain? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the reason I wanted to look at it, so I'm fairly matter of fact, whether it's good or bad. Uh, I think the reaction from the other patients in Vincent's um, made me decide to do it because there was shock in their faces. You can imagine I'm there, my brother, you know, he's got his arm wrapped around me. I've got, the, you know, the big rugby jacket. I've got my UCD kit on, still have my boots on here. Clank, clank, clank yes. across the... You're turning heads to begin with. Pretty much. Um, and you just have these people, like I'm, I'm not joking, turning and looking at you or stopping what they're doing and looking at you because the eye you can physically see obviously my eye is very cloudy now yeah. as time has gone on but it was a heck of a lot worse than what it was and out of its socket and all that sort of stuff so it was just that curiosity of just making sure I knew what I was dealing with uh, and my response um, which I have put in the book you know was very blasé and I think obviously mum had been in the car as well because she came to pick us up yeah. was, was sort of horrified at how blasé I, I was. Maybe that was because I was so young. I don't know. You don't really appreciate the severity of, of what's happening. It struck me as total shock. Probably. I don't think you were processing what you were seeing. No, and I think when I saw the junior doctor in the eye and ear, like I really felt sorry for her because she took one look and was just like, I'll be back in a minute. Yes. Like clearly had no... <laughs> There was a real this is above my pay grade moment for her. And I felt really bad for her, like really did. But then I think that shock turned into sadness then when you're just left alone and you're left with your own thoughts. And when you're talking about the suddenness of everything, like you were suddenly now brought down to your knees. Like you're suddenly here now in uh, a hospital room and it was still dark. Like they didn't turn on the lights or anything. So you're just literally sitting in the dark, like wondering For what 45 is, minutes. Yeah, yeah, wondering what is going on here. Um, so yeah, it just, it, everything happens so, so quickly. Yeah. Uh, surgery happens, it's four hours. It's um, an ordeal, obviously. And a couple of things in the immediate aftermath. One, the video of the incident is reviewed and it turns out that the stud belonged to one of your teammates, which is a relief. You didn't want, I suspect, the never-ending suspicion of, well, was that deliberate, which would mm -hmm. be uh, trickier, I suppose, to park mm. and leave behind. Massively. And we were really relieved because, you, I mean, for anyone that's played rugby, you know the difference between a full-on stamp and a backwards motion. You know, rucking obviously is not as to the front now as, as previous years but you definitely get a, a sense of what the action or the differences of the action is so 
thankfully there was a blue sock um, and um, we later found out you know who it was and all that sort of stuff so um, he wrote you a letter yeah, he was very gracious and came to visit me. I don't know if I would because, I mean, he's also been put in a tricky situation and he's probably sick to death <laughs> of, of hearing the story at this stage, yeah. you know, and, and he has to carry that, I suppose, as well with him. But uh, that's just part of the story. And he he showed a lot of courage in what in what he did. Um, but again, I was, I think my family thought I should scream or shout at him and... Mm. Again, whether it was just the not processing part of the whole thing, but, uh, you know, it was just when you're injured, you just try and get back as quick as possible. Leinster is so competitive and you're in the era of Contaponi had just gone. Johnny's obviously on the start of his incredible yeah. path, even though he'd played before, but he just, you know, um, his trajectory just was, was, he was just moving up so quickly yeah. uh, and, and everyone else coming in. So you just couldn't waste time um, you couldn't waste time and you just needed to get back as quick as possible and that honestly was my mm. my thought process. And I guess you've never seen the video of the incident. Is there any sense that your teammate, while he absolutely was not trying to injure a fellow a teammate, was careless? Does that keep you up at times? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, people ask, do you wish it never happened or... or, or you know, how do you do you feel to wish it never happened? I mean, I can never give a definitive answer about that. Was it clumsy? Yeah, of course. Um, but everything is such a split second. Like you're you're talking about a ripping motion from one side to on your back to then his foot connecting with a face stud with an eyeball. How many times do you see players coming off with cuts above their eye, under their eye? And it just so happened that this time it yeah. just went a little bit further. Um, so yeah, I mean, it probably, I mean, it was clumsy. Um, How quickly did you get from um, the why me stage to the what you've just outlined, which that can happen and it's unlucky because the, you're entitled to a fair degree of how I think, bloody unlucky was I? I think I went straight away to that, so I didn't feel any why me. It was the why me later on. Okay. So when I retired and moved away to Italy, um, and all that sort of emotion was building up and being sort of powerless to not compete and see other guys winning matches and um, earning caps and winning trophies and all that sort of stuff that was the stuff that I wasn't in control of Yeah, uh, and that really hurt Your recovery from that initial awful moment is really very good mm -hmm. especially when you think that your brother was told at Vincent's well the vision's gone the eye's probably gone so it surprises everybody it pleases everybody you are absolutely militant about sleeping upright putting in your drops you just follow everything to the letter of the law and and you do get back you are part of Leinster and, and you've been given a full Leinster Academy straight out of school which was um, not something afforded to many leaving cert students not least from a school like St Columbus which doesn't have massive rugby uh, pedigree and so you're you're in amongst it Joe Schmidt is your coach you are training with these guys mm -hmm. Again, with where were you then? Seventy percent vision, would you say, in the eye? So yeah, whenever I got back, which was six months after the injury, got yeah. fifty percent. So that what that would have looked like was you could see blurry figures, you know. Um, but that then generated to outlines of players. Um, but you know, it was still very very hazy. But yeah. I got up, yeah, about seventy seventy percent throughout the season. Yeah. Which was remarkable. I, and, and again, you're around such legends. Like at one point, you're, you're, there's a little paragraph dedicated to just how damn good Eason Asewe is on every front. It won't surprise anyone. It's not breaking news. But you even say if uh, maybe you were quietly to get Joe Schmidt and ask him who's the best player you coached, you, you had a, have a stab that it might be Nasewa. Like, um, unbelievable player. Like, so natural. He could play any position. His, his mind just worked in a different way. Um, always usually made the right call been fortunate enough to play with him and against him jeez you'd much rather play with him like <laughs> honestly and I think now that you know whenever you've you've left or you've stepped back a bit to realise the, the calibre of, of, of player that you were with at the time there like really fortunate to have to have played under coaches like Czech and Schmidt and to have O'Driscoll and Sex and all these Rocky Elson when he was there like I mean that's you know fairy fairy tale stuff but you were in that environment to compete and to compete for, posi for positions so yeah. as I said this was a huge um, speed bump that needed to be uh, got over pretty quickly. 
It's interesting as well that in that period there you're you're at the um, center of gouging incidents, mm. and there's one exchange where uh, somebody has a finger near your eye, and your teammates all rally around, and one of them shouts, you know, don't, do you not know what's happened to this guy? Mm. And his response was, well, I broke my leg last year. You don't hear me complaining about it. So some real gents out there who really welcomed you back Wonderful. into the fold. <laughs> that was my third game back as well. So you know. Um, yeah, I suppose 